like a life-size dollhouse. It was huge and, whoa, was that a whirlpool bath? I was in heaven. <laughs> Slow down, dear. OMG, you even have an indoor badminton court? I love badminton. This was the most amazing house ever. Hey, I'm Helen, and I grew up in a normal house with a normal family. I love my parents and life was great and all, but the one downside was the long journey to my new high school. My mom, Grace, said she had the answer to this and suggested I go and stay with my Aunt Lucy as she lived closer to the school. Okay, so I'd never met Lucy before. Actually, until Mom mentioned her, I didn't even know I had an aunt. Mom explained that Aunt Lucy moved to Canada for business and had only returned to the U.S. recently. This was the first time I had to live so far away from my parents, so I was kind of worried I'd get homesick. But one advantage was my bestie, Madeline, lived right nearby. Awesome, right? Besides, this place was dope. I couldn't stop gawking at that badminton court. Seriously, it was bigger than my house. Aunt Lucy, I guess you must really like badminton. Yes, many people think it's just a backyard game, but it's a true sport to me. Wow, it was a rarity to meet someone with the same taste as me. We chatted for <laughs> ages about our interests. Lucy was so easy to talk to, and I honestly felt like I'd known her for years. I would love to become a pro badminton player, but mom thinks I should keep it as a hobby and find a more stable career. I see, but don't let others discourage you. The true passion is worth pursuing. Let me arrange a training schedule for you. Now, try this. Oh, how do you know I like lobster linguine? At first, living with Lucy was like being in a dream world. She pampered me, bought me clothes I wanted, and cooked the most delicious dishes. But beneath the shine, there was also a darker side. Lucy was super strict. I mean, major general level strict. I had to wake up at 5 a.m. each morning for training, run laps of it for an hour, and hit 50 shuttlecocks over the net in a row. If I missed one, I had to start over again. Meanwhile, I still had to keep up with my homework, and I couldn't go and meet my friends on the weekend or do anything without asking Lucy for permission first. Ugh. At least at school, I could vent to Maddie about it. I expected her to agree with me, but she shrugged and said, I guess your aunt just wants the best for you. Besides, your badminton skills have improved loads. If I could live in a luxurious house, eat delicious food with such a caring aunt, I'd so put up with a grueling training schedule. Yeah, I guess she's right. Maybe I should be more grateful. Of course, on finding out about the school badminton club, I immediately signed up for it. I was walking over to the court, swinging my racket about and ready to show off my skills when these two guys approached me. Go back to the cheerleading team where you belong, sweetie. Leave the court for the real pros. How dare these idiots judge me like this? They hadn't even seen me play. Oh yeah? I challenge you to a game. Then we'll see who's serious. We're the best players in the school, just so you know. Pick one. Suddenly, another guy appeared next to me and said, Then let's play doubles. Oh my god, he's Tyler, the best badminton player in the whole school. I've heard all about his reputation and seen photos of him with a trophy in the school newsletter, but I've never met him before. Surprisingly, he's even cuter in person. Pfft, you can defeat us in singles, but can you cover that useless girl in a duo match? That's it. Scoot over. Let me show you what this useless girl can do. The game started and instantly... Tyler and I vibed on the court and were hitting the shuttlecocks at lightning speed. We won in straight sets, and those losers looked so bummed out. <laughs> Tyler seemed super impressed. And then, good game, Helen. Do you want to hang out again? How about tomorrow? We could go get some food. Mamma mia! How can I say no to that? But when I told Aunt Lucy, she didn't take it so well. Love may seem appealing, but it's a waste of time and energy that will lead to a decline in your badminton abilities. Your grades, your mood, everything. You're too immature to deal with those type of emotions right now. This was ridiculous. I wasn't a little kid. I was perfectly capable of making my own decisions and following my own feelings. He's a sweet guy who helped me out. Of course he did. All guys appear nice at first. Maybe if you just gave him a chance. Wake up, Helen, and stop yourself from throwing away your dreams for some boy. Ugh, it was no use. My aunt was too stubborn to listen. I stormed up to my room, feeling frustrated. No way was I letting my aunt's strictness ruin things with my dream guy. So I decided to sneak out to meet Tyler. 
But how? Ah, I know exactly the person who can help. Mats, Redcoat, Aunt Lucy won't let me see Tyler. Please help me distract her. Okay, but only if you get me a signed copy of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Easy peasy. After that day, I was able to go on multiple dates with Tyler, all thanks to Maddie's help. She always came up with the most convincing excuses, like I was going to her house for group study or we were going to a super important event. Then one time when I was supposed to study at home, it was actually Maddie pretending to be me. Later, I sneak back into my room, all giddy. You wouldn't believe how great our date was today. But Maddie just gave this awkward look. What's up? Did my aunt suspect something? N- no, everything's fine. Then she immediately climbed out of the window. Hmm, strange. But the next day, she acted like nothing had happened. So I let it slide. She must have just felt unwell or something. Meanwhile, things with Tyler were getting better and better. After a romantic date, we walked home. And suddenly, Tyler stopped me, looking all shy and nervous. Helen, I I really like you, and I like spending time with you. Be my girlfriend, will you? OMG, this was the best thing that had ever happened to me. I flung my arms around him and yelled out of my lungs, yes! When I finally let go of him, out of nowhere, a kid on roller skates bumped into me and sent me tumbling into the road. A car zoomed toward me, and before I could process anything, Tyler sprinted forward and pushed me away. When I opened my eyes, he was lying there unconscious. I panically called an ambulance and went with him to the hospital. As I sat in the waiting room with floods of tears, I was so scared and didn't know what to do that I ended up calling Aunt Lucy. Only a few minutes later, I saw her hurrying toward me, looking dead serious. Helen, what have I told you? You lied to me to hang out with a boy? I had no heart to argue about that and immediately burst into a fresh bout of tears. It's my fault. Tyler risked his life to save me and now he's hurt. Aunt Lucy's demeanor softened and she pulled me in closer. After a while of consoling me, she finally opened up and shared a story I didn't expect. Actually, I fell in love when I was around your age, but he betrayed me. I just don't want you to be hurt like that. Oh, that's terrible. But Tyler is a good guy. I just know he is. He saved me. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Okay, I'll trust your judgment and give you my blessing to get to know him further. Thank you. Right then, the doctor appeared and told us that Tyler was all right and he would make a full recovery in a few days. Thank goodness. When Tyler was back, Aunt Lucy stuck to her word and gave me and him a chance together. She even offered to give both of us a badminton lesson. Brace yourself for the craziest training routine ever. But practicing with Tyler made it actually bearable and a lot more fun. I had a big competition coming up, which could get me the professional player title and a chance to join the national team if I won. So I needed all the training I could get. Just one more step away from my greatest dream. Also, I couldn't contain my smile when seeing Lucy gradually warmed up to Tyler. My big day finally came. Mom and Dad were here to support me as well. I excitedly got ready. But when I opened the kit bag... What happened? Oh no! Who's destroyed our babies? I... I think Lucy might have done it. Why on earth would she do that? I overheard her saying that she was only pretending to like Tyler so she could keep an eye on you both. What? I honestly believed that Aunt Lucy was actually giving Tyler a chance. But it still didn't make any sense. Even if Lucy hated Tyler, why would she try to ruin this competition? She knew how much it meant to me. There's one more thing, but I don't think you're ready to hear it. Gosh, just spill the beans, Maddie. Actually, the day I disguised as you, I found something out. Lucy's not your aunt. She's your mom. She wants to take you back to Canada with her and... She knows if you won this contest, then you'd never want to leave. I stood there in complete shock. So, my beloved family I'd known all these years wasn't actually mine? And Lucy? How come she had the brazenness to show up now as my real mother and wanted to take me back? I felt like my whole life had been one big lie and immediately rushed to find Lucy. Is it true? You're my real mom? How did you know? I can't believe you did that to me! You're selfish, terrible, and ruined everything. Go away. I don't want to see you anymore. I don't have a mom like you. Grace is my one and only mother. Lucy looked completely broken, then quietly left. I was shaking in anger and pain when a gentle hand laid on my shoulder. Helen, sweetie, I know it's hard to take it in. Trust me, this was difficult for us all. You all lied to me. How could you just agree to send me off to her? You never consider me as your real daughter, do you? Don't think silly, honey. We love you so much and never want to let you go. Unless it's better for you. Then mom told me how Lucy came and persuaded her. Turned out, Lucy had a very tragic past. 
Since childhood, she'd always been the black sheep in her family. They treated her poorly and despised her badminton passion. Then when she told them she was pregnant, they threw her out. And her boyfriend also ditched her right after that. So she had no choice but to leave me at the orphanage and begin a new life in Canada. After countless hardships, she finally became successful. And all she desired was to reconnect with me. I believe everyone deserves a second chance. That's why I let you two live together for a while. Only if you're happy, I would tell you the truth, so you wouldn't be too shocked. Besides, she can help you more than me now. Hey, you even inherited her badminton spirit. I was stunned for a while. It's true that Lucy left me, but that's because she didn't want me to suffer with her. And I indeed had a happy life. I shouldn't be so rude to her. But it was still a lot to digest, so I went home with Mom. I shut myself away until the next day. Tyler came and tried to convince my gloomy self to go for a walk. I know that's a lot, but I think you should make up with Lucy. Why are you still on her side? She only pretended to be nice to you, and she ruined the contest just to take me away from this perfect life. We can find our chance in plenty of other competitions. But there's only one Lucy. She's your biological mother, and it's fine to be mad with her, but you should never reject her. My mind wandered back to all the happy moments I'd had with Lucy, our interesting chat, the delicious meals she cooked, and the times we played badminton together. She even had a special room to store badminton equipment, especially the rackets. Wait, Lucy treasured badminton rackets. If she simply wanted to stop us from competing in the contest, then she could have just hidden our rackets or pretended that the car broke down. But she would never destroy the rackets like that. Ty, do you remember who else handled our rackets that day? I'm not sure. I, um, oh, I think Madeline had them at some point. So, could it be Maddie? But why? She had no reason to do that. She was my best friend and always supported me to play badminton. I stormed over to Maddie's house, but she's arguing with her dad on the doorstep. You useless, pathetic rascal. Go then. I don't care. Maddie ran off in tears, and I followed her to an alley. Seeing her like that made some of my anger toward her fade. Hey, what's going on? Maddie seemed surprised to see me. She tried to dodge some of my questions at first, but seeing nowhere to hide, she finally confessed. My mom left me to that alcoholic dad who does nothing but shout at me all day. You have two moms who love you, and I I don't even have one. I was angry at Lucy because, to me, all of the moms who gave up their child are heartless and deserve no forgiveness. She even wanted to take you to Canada. I couldn't lose you, too. The fear and jealousy got the better of me, so I broke your rockets, then blamed Lucy. I'm so sorry. This sounds tough, but you still shouldn't have done it. I'm always here to listen to you, and I'm not moving anywhere. You're stuck with me. When Maddie felt better, I took her to my home and intended to find Lucy to apologize for everything. But Mom said Lucy had decided to go back to Canada and was on her way to the airport. I immediately hailed a cab to the airport, then ran through departures, desperately trying to find Lucy. I was starting to think I was too late, when suddenly, I spotted her about to walk through towards security. Lucy! Mom, please don't go! I... I thought you don't want me. No, I was just confused and angry and... I'm sorry that I hurt you. We finally sorted things out and agreed to give each other a chance to start over. So, what happened next? Well, Lucy decided to expand her business to the U.S. so she could stay here with me. My wonderful adoptive parents took Maddie in after helping her get away from her toxic father. So now I have two amazing moms, an awesome sister, and... Yes, you know it! A super cute, thoughtful boyfriend. I raised the bow, hyper-focused. The target was right in front of me. Watch me conquer. Only... Grandpa! That one would have hit the bullseye! I'm just teasing. <laughs> You're getting real good, pumpkin. Hi, I'm Gina, and I love archery. My grandfather, my only family, introduced me to the sport. He always encouraged me to join contests, saying I had a knack for it. But competitions, not really my thing. Talking to strangers was enough of a challenge for me. But my only friend, Bailey, is lovely and cheerful. We've been close since childhood to the day we came to the city for high school and became roommates. My new life promises fun and excitement, but I missed my grandpa dearly and wrote to him often. 
Dear Grandpa, my life here is wonderful. The dorm room is nice, clean, and tidy, and every morning, soothing instrumental music from the speaker reminds me of the times we enjoyed music and a tea together on the front porch. Ugh, Bailey, turn it down. And are you going to do something about your mess? Jeez, it's an organized mess. Ask me about anything, and I can find it immediately. By the way, there's a welcome party for freshmen tonight. Shall we go? Nah, I'm too tired. Come on, Gina, it'll be fun. You'll make some new friends, too. It's just... Okay, stay here then. I'm leaving. Somehow, I felt a bit empty. I'd never noticed that Bailey and I were so different until recently. Bailey's a social butterfly who can make new friends easily. And me? I was introverted and reserved. Hmm, I can't keep being this way. I came to the city for the experience. Duh. So when Bailey asked me to go to the school's fair, I immediately agreed. When the day came, while Bailey's chatting and giggling with other students, I just kind of absentmindedly faded into the background. Since Bailey did not seem to notice my absence, I decided to look around on my own. Suddenly, a scream startled me. Thief! Thief! I turned around to see a thief running away with a girl's handbag. Without thinking, I grabbed a set of bow and arrows nearby and shot at him. That's when I saw another arrow. Flying in the same direction, both arrows hit the thief right on his head and knocked him to the ground. I looked for the other archer and saw the Greek god Apollo, who's also looking at me. Then he went to handle the thief as I took the opportunity to quietly leave the scene. I was still daydreaming about that guy when Bailey barreled into our dorm with a group of friends. I quickly turned myself into a burrito and pretended to be asleep. But Bailey ruthlessly unfurled me with a wide grin. Hey, G, there's someone I'd like you to meet. Samantha, head of the school's archery club. Bailey told me you're quite an archer. Yeah, sort of. Well, we're looking for new members. You should come by. I'll be sure to stop by. Thanks. After school the next day, I visited the archery club and saw a familiar face. That's the guy from yesterday. Ooh, he also blows on the arrow like Grandpa. So cute. Oops, busted. Am I hallucinating or is he walking toward me? Hi, you were at the school fair. Your shot was phenomenal. I'm Chris, by the way. I'm Gina. So you're new here? Actually, I'm not sure if I'm going to join yet. Well, how about a little demonstration? Panicked, I tried to shoot with shaky hands and totally botched it. Sorry. Relax, you got this. He leaned over me and my heart was beating like crazy. I took a deep breath, softly blew at the fletching, and this time, I hit the target. See? Amazing shot. You should be more confident and open up so more people can get to know you. So Chris is into extroverts? He's right. It must be great being around an outgoing, confident girl like Bailey. She'd only been here for a week and already knew half of the school, and everyone loved her. So later that day, after struggling with myself, I decided to ask Bailey for help. Help? With what? Help me be you, an extrovert. You're fine the way you are. Why change? Right then, Samantha came to pick her up to go to a birthday party. Want to join us? Uh, you'd rather stay here and re, correct? You know me. Then Bailey left, just like that. All right, if she doesn't want to help, I'll do it myself. Time to break out of my cocoon. So I spend the next few hours giving myself a makeover. Not bad, was it? When I arrived at the party, everyone gawked at me. Hey, are you the sun? Cause your beauty is blinding me. If so, you should stay 93 million miles away from me. As much as I wanted to run straight home, a voice in my head kept screaming, socialize. On the internet, they said extroverts are always ready to make friends, like Bailey, who's part of every single conversation. So I mustered all courage to throw myself into the largest group who's talking about cute Arctic animals. I remembered a communication tip, lead the conversation. So I did. Isn't it so sad that those animals are losing their habitat to climate change? The next five minutes was me monologuing about the issue, but they didn't seem too interested. Okay, plan B. Bailey also always knows how to stand out, so when everyone started dancing, I stood in the middle of the room and danced my heart out. But after that, everyone looked at me like I was an alien, including Chris. When I was finally in my room, I felt totally defeated. Do you seriously want to be an extrovert? I need to, Bailey. If so, maybe take it slow and don't push yourself too hard. You don't have to become outgoing overnight. Ugh, Bailey clearly didn't believe I could do it. Fine, I'll show her she wasn't the only charming extrovert here. 
My first order of business was joining the archery club. That would be my best chance to impress Chris. To make up for the embarrassment at the party, I braced myself and approached the most playful guy here. Uh, hi, I'm Gina. I like your shirt. Um, thanks. I'm Patrick. Patrick is the student council president. He's here to help promote the archery club. Then whenever Chris passed by, I tried to joke around with Patrick, although he seemed distracted. But Chris just turned away and looked unhappy. Gina, what's the deal with you and that Chris guy? He keeps looking over here. Oh, Chris? He's just a club mate. Maybe it's because he doesn't like me very much. Boys thing. Anyway, I'm thinking about joining this club. Would you teach me? Sure thing. After that, Patrick and I often practiced archery together. I got too excited and set the target as far as I could, pulled a string with all my might, and tried to keep my cool as the arrow hit the bullseye. Out of nowhere, Chris popped out. Awesome, Gina. Best shot I've ever seen. Impressive, Gina. Wanna grab a drink before you teach me how to do that? Right then, Chris offered me a bottle. You like apple juice, right? I saw you only drink that at the party. Eee! He noticed! Thank you! Would you like a ride back later? Finally, a chance to get closer to Chris! I'll drive you, Gina. I'm more familiar with that route. I was gonna say no, but Patrick had already pulled me away. Why did he ruin my romantic moment? Maybe he liked me too, but I already had my sights set on Chris. Chris seemed to care about me, but it would take a little more for us to actually be a thing. Everything was falling into place, and I felt like I was becoming more outgoing. Though sometimes I still took detours or hid in the restroom to avoid small talks, things with Chris were going well. But the next day, I saw Bailey and Chris locking arms and laughing happily on the street. Are they dating? Then why did Chris keep my hopes up and act like he cared about me? All my efforts were for nothing. Even if I tried to be like Bailey, of course Chris would prefer the original. I glumly went to my room shortly before Bailey, Holly, jolly as usual, came back. You look awfully happy. Hot date? Nope, not at all. Are we having secrets now? Of course not! Anyway, what are you up to today? Beating around the bush, huh? She's obviously in love with Chris, but why keep it a secret? Just so they could still mess with others' feelings. After that, I refused to talk to Bailey and avoided Chris. Whenever he greeted me, I'd pretend I didn't see him. And if he approached me, I'd go to Patrick or ask him to take me home. It was petty, but what else could I do? In Patrick's car, I got Chris's texts. He probably just wanted to two-time me. So I turned off my phone. Everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You're not a very good liar, but I have just the thing to cheer you up. A few minutes later, we pulled up to a quiet spot with a stunning view. But magnificent as the sunset was, I still felt the sadness wash over me. Want to talk about it? And I did. I really did. It felt good to finally get everything off my chest. Patrick listened patiently, nodding and understanding. When I finished, it's already twilight. Thank you for listening to my rant. Sure, anytime. Uh, I want to be there for you, Gina, and I would never hurt you. I know you're into Chris, but I really care about you. You're a true hidden gem, and I want to help you be all that you're meant to be. I was surprised. At that moment, Patrick became even more attractive than I'd ever thought. Maybe I could, I should, be with someone like him and forget about those toxic people. So, I agreed to date him. The following day, Patrick already made it public. See, that's what a decent guy would do. He took me to the spa, cooked for me, and was always so sweet. I'd never felt this way for anyone, and it actually felt like love. However, it wasn't always peachy being Patrick's girl. He constantly attended tons of events as the student council president and would have me as his plus one. On those occasions, Patrick would talk to everyone while I stood awkwardly. I wanted to join, but didn't know how. All right, laughing would totally show that I'm following their conversation. But everyone just stared blankly at me. What's so funny about my grandma's broken hips? Oh, jeez, I wanted to dig myself a hole immediately. Soon after, Patrick told me to utilize my archery skills for a fundraising commercial shoot. The pictures went viral, and I became popular. People wanted to befriend me everywhere I went, and it was exhausting. When I told Patrick, he said, That's good. You'll be the face of this fund, which will help a lot of people. Like Katniss Everdeen and the First Rebellion. I'm so proud to have you as my girlfriend. Let's keep this up, okay? Something about that didn't sit well with me. But isn't this the life I've always been dreaming of? I was so busy with Patrick's plans that I had no time left for myself. I even forgot to write to Grandpa, and it had been a while since I last went to the archery club. Bailey tried to catch up with me, but I still ignored her. We grew further apart, even though we shared a room. The show today was suddenly cancelled, so I seized this chance to drop by the archery club. I got more comfortable and liberated with each arrow I shot. I finally felt like myself again. 
When I was done, I caught Chris staring at me. I was instantly flustered and tried to leave, but Chris followed me. Gina, I don't even recognize you anymore. It's like you're trying to be someone you're not. Are you really happy? You're the fake one. You like social butterflies, don't you? If I stop trying, I'll become invisible again. You just don't like Patrick, and it bothers you that he's my boyfriend. You're right. I don't like him, but it has nothing to do with this. Not wanting to hear any more of his lies, I just stormed off. But as much as I didn't want to believe Chris, his words got me thinking. I found Bailey waiting for me in our dorm room. She looked a bit timid. How are things going between you and Patrick? Everything okay? Of course. You got a problem with us? <sighs> Can you come with me after school tomorrow? There's something I want to show you. I followed her out of curiosity. Bailey led me to the back of the school, then told me to hide in a corner and wait. Then I saw Patrick. He wrapped his arm around Bailey, who promptly pushed him away. Come on, I know you've got a thing for me, Bailey. Why won't you leave me alone? You literally have a girlfriend. Pfft, Gina, I made that chick who she is. A cash grab to make a quick buck off of. That stupid girl still believes that was actually a fundraiser. I could have picked anyone, but the fact that it bothers Chris when I'm with her was the icing on top. I can't be with that obnoxious weirdo, but you? A magnificent work. I can't take it anymore and bolted towards Patrick and slapped him right across his smug face. You are the biggest jerk I've ever met. Uh, you're the biggest loser I've ever met. You have the magnetism of a towel. Watching you embarrass yourself in front of all my friends is painfully terrible. No wonder they snicker about you behind your back. I dashed away in tears as Bailey scolded him. She caught up to me shortly after. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. Recently, Patrick started flirting with me. I couldn't go without showing you his true colors. You can say that because everyone loves you. Even Chris chooses you. And I thought I had a chance with him. It's so unfair. People will never treat introverts like me the way they treat you. <gasps> Wait, you like Chris? Having no energy left to be angry, I slumped down, sobbing. Listen, I'm sorry that I refused to help you become an extrovert. The reason is, you're already amazing, Gina. Since we were kids, I've always admired you. You're smart, patient, and determined. What? Would you believe me if I said I wanted to be more like you? But then I realized that introverts and extroverts have their own strengths, and we do best when we're ourselves. That's why I am who I am, and you should be none other than yourself. I held back my tears as best as I could and hugged Bailey tightly. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you. Thank you for telling me what I need to hear. I returned to my room and saw a letter from Grandpa. He asked how I was lately and why I stopped writing to him. He knew living in a new environment would be difficult, but as long as I understood my own worth, I could overcome everything. He finished his letter by saying he'll always love me unconditionally. Tears welled up in my eyes again. Shortly after, Bailey came back all excited. I have a surprise for you. When we got outside, Chris was already waiting. I was extremely embarrassed and confused to see him. Gina, from the moment we met at the fair, I haven't stopped thinking about you. I was impressed with your archery skills, but before I knew it, I was charmed by your intelligence, kindness, even your shyness. Aren't you dating Bailey? What? Chris is my cousin. He talks about you all the time. I was going to set you two up, but you were already with someone else. <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears, and my heart went wild. At that moment, Bailey received another flirty text from Patrick. Ugh! What am I supposed to do with this sleaze ball? Well, well, well. Could you believe it? Bailey let him hear blindfolded for a surprise. Okay, ready for my present? Patrick was surely surprised to see me aiming right at him. You better come clean about all the cheating you did. It wasn't cheating. You weren't even my girlfriend, loser. Before he could finish, I launched an arrow right above his head. Lucky for you, my aim was just right. But who knows, a loser like me could have missed. Patrick freaked out and literally peed his pants. Then he confessed to all his faults. Siphoning off public funds, love scamming for money, which all had been recorded. Did. As soon as the video was posted, Patrick was boycotted and lost his student council president position. He had to switch schools after a week. I finally felt confident in myself and won many archery competitions. During the holiday, I brought Bailey and Chris back home to meet my grandpa and showed him my many trophies. Remember everyone, be the best version of yourself and the right person will love the real you. But I like you, you know that. Right at that moment, a girl walked over to them. Babe! Immediately, Nam turned around and pulled her in his arms. Here you are. 
Then he kissed her on the lips, and Ronnie was frozen in her spot. Who, who is she? Ah, uh, I forgot. She's Chi, my girlfriend. Hello. W what? You're lying! If you have a girlfriend, I must have known! Just want to keep my personal life and work life separate. Cryptic much? Then Nam and his newly announced girlfriend walked off, leaving Veronica behind with a broken heart. But I've liked you first! So my love since I was 14 had withered even before it started to bloom? Turns out I was just fooling myself all this time. That night, Veronica couldn't sleep a wink. It was too painful for her to face the truth, but she couldn't help showing up in Nam's hotel the next day. But little did she expect that since that day, she was everywhere in the hotel and literally clinging to Nam. Oh, Bay, sit down here. You've been wandering in my dreams enough. Your legs might get hurt. So you come sit here too. I'm afraid I have a serious vitamin D deficiency because I was far away from you, my only sunshine for the whole night. And that only made Veronica filling in frustration. And also suspicion. Say, ah, I woke up early to cook for you. My bae needs the most organic and fresh food ever in this world. But he's allergic to peanuts! Oops, is it so? You, cheese, right? It's chi, no ending sound. <laughs> Whatever, what kind of girlfriend are you not knowing your boyfriend's allergy? How reckless. His face would be seriously swollen like a chipmunk eating that. There must be something off between them. Hey, how did you guys meet? We met in Delat. Right, on a business trip. Thursday, September 21st, last year. It doesn't need to be that detailed, does it? The next day, Nam's hotel was throwing a small party within the staff. It was fun, but seeing the lovey-dovey couple was only a bug in the eye to Veronica. So she left for some fresh air, and when returning to the main hall, Veronica overheard Chi talking on the phone with somebody. I got what you want, Bay. You're right. This guy Nam has nothing besides being rich. W what So she just used Nam for money? What a snake! Veronica was about to jump to confront her, but she'd gone away, so she immediately came to find Nam and was excited to expose his so-called girlfriend's real face. But instead, he went blast on her. You stop your nonsense already! She's a good-natured girl, not some spoiled young lady who insists on having anything she wants. Are you implying I am that spoiled young lady? Your words, not mine. You've gone too far, Nam. I like you, but it doesn't mean you can talk rubbish about me. Okay, fine, I'd leave you alone. And with that, Veronica ran away, tears streaming down her cheeks. This is what he's been thinking of me? I've known him for ages, but now he treated me like a thorn in his eye, and even thought ill of me just because of some random girl? Right then, Chi approached Nam. Is there something wrong? Nothing. Anyway, thank you for your cooperation. Seems like she's not gonna be messing anymore. You're welcome. Ah, uh, and also deliver my thanks to him. His idea is top notch. Then Nam left, but he wasn't sure he's happy with what just happened. Was I too harsh on her? Early the next morning, Veronica was woken by a knock. What are you doing here? I remember not making any troubles to you since last night. Um, today I will have a trip to Hoi An to build a customized tour for our hotel's customers. Wanna join? No, I don't want to bother you. If so, what a pity. <sighs> I just happened to know a good bang me, Hoi An. But you don't wanna go. It's okay. Huh? Why didn't you say it sooner? I've always wanted a bite on Hoi An Bang Mai. Sign me in! <laughs> By the way, it's Bang Me, not Bang Mai. Okay, Bang Me. Yeah, that's it. Later, when they arrived in Hoi An, Ronnie was mesmerized by the medieval grace of this ancient town. The streets of gold and yellow houses were blooming in colorful paper flowers along with vibrant lanterns. Wandering around the town, Ronnie felt a surge of excitement and nostalgia about her country of birth that she parted since she was small. Aw, this is cute. And here! <laughs> Ronnie, now we look like twins. Let's take a picture together. Twin my butt? Oh, I almost forgot the real reason I'm going here. But they came to the Bang Me store to see it was jammed with people queuing. That didn't make Ronnie waver a bit, as the mouth-watering Bang Me was the only thing in her mind now. She had been patiently waiting for her turn for almost 30 minutes. But right then there was a girl with little puppy eyes looking up to her. Ronnie looked at her, then her newly baked Bang Me on her hands. And after a few seconds of hesitation, she gave it to the little girl. Hey kid, it's now yours! Huh? What's she doing? Hasn't she been longing for it all this time? Got bored already? Poof, I just don't want those kids to wait under this scorching heat. Okay, okay, go eat under that tree. I'll get you another one. You want some? Nah, I've eaten enough. <laughs> Nam's buying bread for me. So sweet. 
His kind offer made her heart dance like crazy, not knowing from afar she was glaring at her with bullet eyes. Ronnie was happily devouring her bread when she noticed an old woman with the bamboo yoke selling something strange. What's this? Bang Yakto, buy it. Yummy, yummy. It's Vietnamese dragon beard candy. Candy? So those threads are edible? Buy it for me, Nam. Bay, only kids like this. But Nam still agreed to get some for Ronnie. She was excited about the strange snacks, maybe too excited that she blew the powder so hard, accidentally getting it all over Chi's face. What? How dare you? Uh, oops, I'm so sorry, but you look like Snow White. Just a bit of a variation. <laughs> Are you okay? Oh, I'm okay. Super okay. No big deal, sis. Do I look okay to you? I think she's not some kind of sweet girl she seems to be. Just wait and see. I'm gonna expose you. And you know what? If Nam wasn't here, today would be your end. Later that night, Chi secretly went outside to meet someone. How shameless she is! The audacity of her acting flirty with someone having a girlfriend? I'm afraid she would mess up our plan, hun. If so, we'd better hurry up. I know what to do. The next morning, seeing no one around, Chi snuck into Nam's office and rummaged everywhere. Gosh, this clean freak! Where would he keep the documents? Then a mysterious drawer in the shelf caught her eyes. She was about to crack it when Nam's assistant walked in. Hey, what are you doing here? It's not a place you can easily walk in like this. Then do you know who I am to speak disrespectfully like this? I'm your boss's girlfriend, so I can go to his office whenever I want. You guys, stop! Miss Mai, you can retreat now. When the assistant left, Nam looked around his office, now turned upside down for some reason. Chi, can you tell me what you're doing in my office? Uh, nothing. I just... I'm just looking for my purse here. And you, you've just embarrassed me in front of your employee while you're supposed to protect me. Then a big falling out broke between them. And right at the time, Veronica was passing by and heard their lousy arguments. Ooh, what's this? <laughs> I said it right. Everyone knows they're not for each other just by looking. See, they're already beefing each other fiercely even before I lay a finger. <laughs> Then I had to remind you that you're just my fake girlfriend. Please know the boundary here. Fine, your fake girlfriend will go. Let me see how you deal with your tail. Isn't the purpose of hiring me to chase off Miss Annoying Veronica? You, mind your words. You need me more than you think, sweetie. Veronica was shattered into pieces with the information she just got. So nothing's going on between them for real. But Nob hates me this much to even hire a nobody to be his girlfriend? Just to get away from me? What did I do wrong? That night, Ronnie was crying to sleep with an aching heart. Days after, she locked herself in a room and buried in blankets with the haunting thoughts she couldn't brush off. Nam texted to ask about Ronnie, but now she didn't want anything to do with him. It was not until Grayson knocked the door that Veronica sluggishly got up. Ronnie, are you okay? I'm fine. Just leave me alone. What do you mean, fine? Look, your eyes are swollen like golf balls. Nam asked me about you. Hey, are you two fighting? Just go! Ask about me? Drop it. I'd better not trouble Nam no more. Guess I'll go back to the States now. As saying, she immediately packed all her stuff and booked the flight at night back to home. On the way, she saw a familiar figure. Chi? What is she doing here at our house at this time? Bay, I'm here, and I brought you the thing you asked me to find in Nam's office. It surely could help our plan. Sensing something off, Ronnie followed her to a dark alley, where Chi set up a meeting with her mysterious partner. See what you got, my sweet pie? Veronica couldn't believe her eyes. Her brother and her crush's fake girlfriend were hooking up? What the heck happened here? You and her? Grayson and Chi looked stunned. Why are you here? It is as important as what I'm seeing right now. Better have a good explanation for this. They exchanged their looks, and Grayson finally gave in, telling everything to his sister. Okay, Ronnie, listen carefully. It's me who suggested Nam to have Chi as his fake girlfriend. Actually... W what But you two? Yes, she's my baby girl and he has no idea. But what for? For his master plan, sis? It's time you know the truth. You still remember why we're in Vietnam, right? Our resort is having a hard time, and it's all because of Nam. This resort once belonged to his family, but their poor business skills only plunged this lucrative business into chaos. And when our family revived the resort, he got jealous and did everything to put it down again. This little ungrateful brat. No! Nam isn't that person! Don't defend him. Don't you see when our family had a scandal? His hotel was suddenly doing better than normal? No way I let that slide easily. It proves nothing. You cannot accuse someone without any evidence. Fine, you want evidence? I'll find it for you. Meanwhile, if you can't be helpful, then don't sabotage my plan. 
deal. I'll leave you one week. And during that time, you're not gonna do anything dirty against Nam as well. The siblings set themselves in a different side on this manner. Grayson was leaving with his girlfriend, while Ronnie was standing here, trying to process everything. It had been such a hard time full of news and truths to her. Yes, the Nam I know would never do such a thing, and I will stay here to prove that my brother has been wrong about him. I hope so. Bay, don't you really let this slide just because your sister said some stupid words, do you? No way, Bay. You know how stubborn my sis is. I only agree so that she could leave us alone. The plan sticks, Bay. The next morning, Veronica went back to work at Nam's hotel as if nothing happened. Oh, you're here? I thought I forced you too much that you dropped already. No, I'm fine. Who do you think I am? Considering me a bug, and now he even thought I'm a quick quitter? Full combo, huh? <sighs> Right then, Chi suddenly appeared, then threw her arms around Nam's neck and kissed him on his cheeks. Hi, Bay. What can I help you with today? Oh, hi, Ronnie. Long time no see. Seeing Chi acting shamelessly loving around Nam in front of Ronnie when she knew all the truth even irked her more. Can't underestimate this snake. What is she scheming? I'd better watch out on her. Later that day, while working near the kitchen, Veronica spotted Chi doing something fishy. I was at the fish market, busy selling some crabs to a customer, when I turned around and saw this guy stealing our fish. He quickly ran away. I grabbed a stone, aiming it at the thief. But suddenly, a guy appeared and it hit him instead. Hey, what was that? Let go of me! Shouldn't you at least apologize? I looked over and the thief was nowhere to be found. The thief's escaped! You should apologize! But the guy just frowned and huffed off. Hi, I'm Serena, and I was brought up here, in this picturesque fishing town. When I was little, I lost mom and dad to the sea, so grandma raised me. We couldn't afford school for me. Instead, I helped grandma sell fish at the market to make ends meet. But things weren't always easy. Serena, you all right? Yes, I just wish people wouldn't steal. I know. Hopefully it was an extra stinky fish that will give them a tummy ache. That's Edward, my best friend since childhood. Edward's parents are also fishermen, so we naturally bond together and grew up inseparable. Later, Edward and I were busy closing when I heard murmurs and saw Mr. Elbridge, the fishing enforcement officer. Anyone caught poaching striped bass will be given a hefty fine. What? You gotta be kidding me! Sir, it's only considered poaching if they were caught out of season, which they're not! Oh really? Do you have the legal documentation to overpower my decision? Nope. Thought as much. He's obviously abusing his power. At home, I told Grandma everything that had happened at the fish market. I know it's not fair, sweetie, but maybe one day you could study, become an amazing lawyer, and help the local fishermen. I want to help. I can tutor you if you'd like. That's brilliant. Since then, Edward stayed true to his word and tutored me. He was smart, kind, and so patient in explaining things to me. Time flies, and by the time I turned 13, I had the biggest crush on Edward, but I had no clue how he felt about me. I'll wash up. In the future, I'll always share the housework with you. What does he mean by that? Does he also have feelings for me? The next day, when Edward and I were having ice cream, some kids came in and started making fun of me. Do you know eating too much ice cream makes you fat? Oh, of course you don't, because you don't go to school. <laughs> she doesn't need to. She's still far smarter than you'll ever be. Why did you always stick up for me? Is it because you think of me as a... as a... As a little sister? I need to stop daydreaming. He doesn't have those kinds of feelings for me. Then, when I turned 17, something terrible happened. Grandma felt so sick that she passed away. At the funeral, I felt so alone with all the adults around, and Edward was nowhere to be seen. When everything was settled, Uncle Leon said he'd take me to live with his family in the city. I had to tell Edward, but when I got to his house, it was all locked up. So I quickly slid a note with my uncle's address under his door, then left for the city. As soon as we walked into the mansion, and Clara and Rachel were already there, frowning. Ugh, can you smell rotting fish? Ew, uh, get yourself some perfume, please. Enough! You will make Serena feel welcome here. Please prepare a nice room and everything Serena needs. Uh-oh, not a good start. But then Uncle Leon had to go away for a business trip and asked Aunt Clara to find me a tutor, as he was afraid going to school might be a shock for me. I was so excited to finally study and pursue my lawyer dream. However... All the tutors Aunt Clara found were terrible. I actually had to teach them simple sums. Meanwhile, Aunt Clara showered me with errands to run. Suddenly, I saw a blur of a dog and boy and... Smash! You idiot! How am I meant to cycle home with an injured knee? You're hearing this, Rex? How is she gonna cycle back home? S sorry, I'll take you home. 
I accepted his offer, mainly because I didn't exactly have much choice. What's your number? Well, that was quick. Stop daydreaming. I need it in case I decide to sue you. The guy, Henry, finally quit fooling around and gave me his number. When we got to the mansion, I caught sight of a familiar figure. Edward! I limped over and looped my arms around him. Who are you? Before I could respond, Henry shrugged his shoulders, then left. Edward then told me all about the tragic events that had happened to him. My father made a bad decision to go dynamite fishing. The Coast Guard caught him, but as he tried to run away, his boat smashed into a reef. We needed to move to the city for his treatment. Luckily, I got a scholarship into college here, so I can study and also care for Dad. I'm so sorry it's taken me this long to find you. That's okay, I understand. It all sounds terrible. What about you? So you live in that big mansion now? Is that guy your boyfriend? Henry? Oh, no, no. He's just good because, well, I wanted to tell you that I missed you and I love you, Serena. B but you said I'm just a sister to you. I was 13. I didn't understand my feelings back then, but I do now. Serena, not having you by my side felt so empty. Will you be my girlfriend? We started dating and having Edward by my side felt so great. I was complaining about my terrible tutors when Edward suggested he become my tutor instead. That's a great idea. You'll need to prepare an atrocious CV for my aunt to hire you. And it worked. I don't expect you to get very far with this one. She is rather dumb. What's the deal with you two? She doesn't like having me here. Halfway through the lesson, Edward got a call from the hospital asking him to pay his dad's bills ASAP before his condition worsened. I was comforting him when Rachel barged in. Serena, go get me some ice. Oh, hello there. Get out! Who's that? Rachel, my cousin. Edward seemed distracted after that. I guess he was upset about his dad. He told me to continue with my worksheet and went to the bathroom. I finished the work, but Edward still hadn't returned. Was he lost in this massive house or something? I went to look for him and was shocked to see him and Rachel happily laughing together. Hi, Serena. I was just getting some water. I ignored Edward and continued studying by myself. Are you jealous? I was just being polite. Darn it, he knew I couldn't be mad at him when he smiled at me like that. But as we continued studying, I couldn't fully shake away my uneasy feeling. But the next day, I was waiting to study with Edward when Edward won't be coming today. What? I asked her why, but she just walked off. As she left, I heard her ask the maid to bring fruits to Rachel and her new tutor. Huh? Since when did Rachel have a tutor? Sensing something was up, I sneaked over to Rachel's room and spotted... Edward? Serena, what are you doing over here? Oh, is stalking your new hobby now? I looked at Edward, but he just sat still, so I ran off with blurry eyes and an aching heart. Edward tried to call me, but I just ignored it. That night, he texted me and insisted on waiting for me. I wanted to hear him out, but I was still so angry at him. Serena, please... Your aunt told me I couldn't tutor you anymore and asked me to be Rachel's tutor instead. I need the money for my dad's treatment. I can't turn this amount of money down. Ugh, my aunt was such a witch! I'm so sorry. I would much rather be tutoring you. You're the only girl for me, but I can't lose this job. So let's keep our relationship a secret, okay? This was no big deal, right? It was me he wanted, not Rachel. Edward's birthday soon arrived and we have a date at this restaurant today. I was excited when my phone buzzed. Sorry, babe, something's come up. Can't make it. X. It must have been something super important for him to cancel like that. But on my way home, I passed another restaurant and couldn't believe my eyes. Edward and Rachel were sitting together. Rage swarmed over me, and before I could stop myself, I charged in there. Edward, how could you? Jeez, what's up with you? He's not even your tutor anymore. Ask him how long he's known me for. Uh, I was just your tutor, that's all. I couldn't believe this, so I stormed off. I felt like such a fool for ever believing his lies. While running in tears, I bumped straight into Henry. You look like you just got dumped. <laughs> it was the straw that broke the camel's back, so I started crying louder. It's not me. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Please stop crying. Anything you want. Anything. Uh, how about the aquarium? It turns out the aquarium was just what I needed. Watching the fish was so relaxing, and Henry was surprisingly a lot of fun to be around. Your parents must be super easygoing to put up with you. Nope, my lawyer mom is way opposite. Oh wow, that's cool. It's my dream to be a lawyer. Is that so? My school's interviewing for a law foundation course. You should apply. A law foundation course, huh? Should I give it a try? I arrived home feeling better, but and Clara wouldn't leave me alone with her usual mocking routines. You spoiled ingrate! Soon you'll be 18 and I can rid my hands of you! 
I had enough. So I decided to apply for the foundation program Henry mentioned. It was time to focus on my dream without any further distractions. I studied hard and went to the library for materials. Henry offered to help, and even though I still found him childish sometimes, he was actually quite smart and knew loads about the law. One time, Henry invited me to come watch his debate team. Only, when I showed up and spoke to Henry, I saw Edward walk in. My dad's ill, yet here you are with him? Serena can go where she pleases. It's okay, Henry. I got it. Rachel's just my friend. I love you, not her. I just need to earn enough money. Then I'll end this mess with Rachel for good. What he did was still hard to accept, but he was in a tough situation. I would be a terrible girlfriend if I didn't support him, right? Despite all this drama, I'd been studying hard, and now it was time for my interview. Only, on my way there, I saw a woman yelling at two students. Watch where you're going, you idiots! Excuse me, but this is a pedestrian crossing, hence the driver's fault for not stopping. How dare you speak the law to me, you little girl! Do you know who I am? But as everyone started buzzing, she had no choice but to drive off. <sighs> what happened? I explained it to him and pointed at the woman's car. He didn't say anything, but seemed quite surprised. We then went to the interview, but when I told the assistant my name, she smiled and said, You don't need to draw a number. Mrs. Shodden was impressed with your profile, so she wishes to interview you herself. It's best you follow the right procedure. I was a bit confused, but Henry knew better than me. Anyway, I had my interview with someone else, and I passed. Yay! Since then, I studied hard, and Henry helped me a lot. On my first oral exam, he even came along to encourage me. Only, as soon as I stepped into the room, I saw that rude woman standing there. Hang on, she's the judge! Nerves wriggled at me, but I kept calm and nailed the exam. But afterward, she charged over to me. Don't expect a pass from me, you manipulative girl, seducing my son to get into this college. Huh? Her son? Who? Mom, you can't do that. The exam's recorded. They'll see you're just being prejudiced. I insist you cut ties with a schemer at once. She humiliated me in front of a crowd and tried to smudge my impeccable reputation. No, she didn't. She was just telling the truth. Oh, and that day, I purposely called her in for an interview, but turned out you intervened. And ever since then, this snake was following you everywhere. So end it at once or leave. So this woman is Miss Shodden? And worse still, she's Henry's mom? Suddenly, Henry grabbed my hand and led me out of there. How dare you! You're ungrateful and spoiled! I only adopted you so I had someone to look after me in my old age. But you know what? You'll never be my son! Don't forget to take your meds twice a day. Seeing him talk back to his mother just to defend me, I couldn't help but ask, Henry, why did you help me so much? It's because mom was in the wrong, and seeing you getting pushed around hurts me a lot. Why, Henry? Because I like you a lot. Let me be there for you. Um, Henry, your mom shouldn't have spoken to you like that, but she was only angry because she cares about you. You should talk to her. I really hope things will turn out fine between them. Henry dropped me home, and now all I could think about was his love confession. To be honest, I do have feelings for Henry, but what about Edward? What about our years spent together? Suddenly, I got a text from Edward, asking to meet up. I guess it was time to sort this out. While waiting for Edward to order ice cream, I got a message from Henry, saying he was coming to my place for some great news. I asked him to come pick me up instead. This reminds me of our fishing village in summer and getting ice creams at the end of a sweltering day. I love you, Serena. I always cherish our memories together every day. Edward, actually, this isn't working. I think we should stop seeing each other. W what? Why? I soon realized that something was wrong with our relationship. I just didn't have the courage to face it. We had a special friendship that I cherished and nurtured, but now I think it's time for me to accept the truth that we're not meant for each other. Bye, Edward. I wish you the best with Rachel. As I stepped out of there, I saw Henry waiting for me, and I instantly felt better. I made up with my mom. She apologized for what she said in her temper and told me that I would always be her real son. Henry, that's brilliant news! Right then, I got a message from Miss Shodden. Serena, I apologized for my behavior. I am most pleased Henry is getting to know such a righteous lawyer in the making. It looks like everything's falling into place. I arrived home, not expecting to see Rachel in a fit of tears. Mom, make her leave! This is all her fault! How dare you bewitch Edward! He's quit tutoring Rachel, and now my poor Rachel is distraught! I will keep on hiring you awful tutors and see how long it takes until you break. Ahem, <laughs> is that so? So Uncle Leon stopped Rachel's allowance and took Aunt Clara's credit cards off her. He also made them apologize to me. 
I told him about my foundation placement and he was so happy for me and offered to rent me an apartment near the college. It's time to live my dream. Now I just had one thing left to do. Take Henry to visit my hometown with me. This place looks familiar to me. <gasps> I know, I think I came here as a child. Yes, this weird little girl threw a stone at me and then got mad. I suddenly realized Henry was that tourist guy I met when I was 10. Yep, that would be me. <laughs> Henry seemed surprised, then suddenly pulled me in. I guess some things are just meant to be. Annyeonghaseyo! I'm Minzi from Seoul. Do you believe conspiracy theories are real? Because I do. Before I tell you my paranormal story, please like and subscribe. Nothing much to say about myself. I'm timid, introverted, but above all, I have a big ambition to webtoon horror category. Ahem! It's one of a kind, right? I've spent sleepless nights on that. Go kneel in the hallway for 30 minutes. Now! Aw, oh, man. Creepy Mincy is at it again. She wants to haunt the whole class with those ugly doodles or something? Ugly? Well, not as ugly as your... your grandmother. The whole class gasped at my insensitive words. But it's that girl. Supin's fault first. No matter how invested I was into my draft, it only ended up another chance for Supin and her posse to laugh at me. And well, thanks to my poor communication skills, no one wants to be my friend. Well, except Hajun, my childhood friend. He's always been so nice to me, not to mention he's handsome, friendly, and smart. You could tell I had a crush on him, right? But of course, I have no guts to tell him. <sighs> One day I was riding my bike around when I suddenly saw flyers from Blackwood Publishing, the biggest publisher on Webtoon. They're looking for a comic collaborator. Oh wow, I could send mine to them, but would I stand a chance? I bet the candidates are way more talented than me. As, I guess I better stop dreaming. Just then a skater kid dashed towards me. I managed to dodge him, but ended up crashing onto the pavement fence. I felt myself flip through the air and then everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I found myself on the hospital bed. Mom and Dad were beside me. They looked like they couldn't believe it, then burst into tears. Mincy, honey, you're finally awake. Thank God. You've been in a coma for the whole month. We were worried sick. Hold on a sec. A whole month in a coma? Was I that seriously injured? It took me a few days to recover and process all of this before going back to school. Bet these kids didn't even notice I was missing class for a month, though. But suddenly, someone sprung on my back. Supin? Ah, oh, here you are, Urichingu! Let's go shopping today! The dress you picked me last time was perfect for my date! W what dress? Am I friends with these mean girls now? And not just them. Everyone else seemed to be friendly to me all of a sudden. They gave me cookies, carried my food tray, and even lent me their notebooks. It's weird, but kinda nice, though. <laughs> Except, the only person I cared about just straight up ignored me. Hey, Hajun, wait up! Are you alright? I'm fine. It's none of your concern anyway. Oh, I just want to check in on you. <sighs> Could today get any weirder? Yes, it did. When I came home, I suddenly received an email from Blackwood Publishing. Congratulations! Your digital comic is now officially published on our website. To celebrate your success, please come to our office tomorrow. Huh? Is this a prank? I quickly checked, and it's not. My comics were literally on the headliner. But how? I mustered all the courage and went to the publisher. One step in, and I was overwhelmed by all the facilities. It was all so new to me. But just then, a group of people flocked around me and babbled to me nonstop, like they'd known me before. Yeah, our faith boy group BOF, Boys Over Flowers, is holding a concert tonight. Those opas make my emo heartbeat like crazy. Hey, you should come with us. It's gonna be so much fun. Eek! Oh, but didn't those boys only lip sync and dance half-heartedly? I even heard people say it's a waste of money going to their concert. Guys, did I say something wrong? Suddenly, I got this chill down my spine. Someone's hands were crawling around my waist. My boo-boo's here. Ah, pervert! I turned around and slapped him in the face. Oh, why did you do that? It's me who should ask this. Why did you touch me? Are you serious? Wait, are you still sulking with me? What? I'm sorry, okay? Now your boyfriend's ready for some snuggles. Boyfriend? Last time I checked, I still had the biggest crush on Hajun. How did I settle for this dandy? The guy was extremely clingy. He wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. Um, don't you have any work to do? Work? I am. I'm tending to the artwork of my life. You! 
Uh, sure. He also kept insisting on seeing my webtoon draft to help me polish it. Help my butt? He only messed it all up. Not to mention, everything is completely new to me, but everyone acted like I'm so used to all of this. This didn't feel right. Later the day I told my parents about this, and they said the doctor did mention possible memory loss due to brain injury. Hmm, makes sense. But why did they seem all anxious? Over the next few days, I tried to cope with my new life, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Like, I now had my favorite seat in the canteen. You nerds are sitting on Minzy's spot. Move! And apparently, I got a new hobby of skipping school now. What's the matter? You've done this so many times before. <laughs> why did I even do this? Hajun, on the other hand, still kept distance from me. Until today, we had a project discussion. I tried to break the ice, but he only replied coldly. Why are you here? This whole month you've ditched me to hang out with your hot friends, and now you suddenly want to talk to me again? The, the whole month? What do you mean? You suddenly turned 180 degrees and became this attention seeker. You even pulled stupid pranks on those mean girls and got them to worship you as their leader. B but I was in a coma the whole month. <laughs> You're kidding, right? No, why would I joke about something like that? Then who was the Mincy I saw every day at school the past month? Was he saying I was in two places at once? How was that possible? Hajun came up with a bunch of conspiracy theories, then concluded that I had an imposter, and she had been replacing me while I was in the hospital. It made perfect sense, but so bizarre at the same time. Seeing how freaked out I was, Hajun gently comforted me, saying he'd help me figure this out. I knew it. He still cared about me deep down. While we were discussing, Su Pin and her clique came interrupting us. Hey, Mincy! What are you doing with this geek? Remember our group meetup today with the Ansan Highs boys? Meet up? Uh, no, I don't think I can- Of course she remembers. Can I come too? I'll keep my mouth zipped. Fine, now hurry up. Psst, what are you up to? Your imposters must have known about this meetup, so she might be there. This is our chance to catch her. Except, the imposter was nowhere to be found, while I was stuck with these self-obsessed dudes. Where's your sass, Mincy? Introduce yourself. Oh, um, hi. Uh, I'm Mincy. You can call me Sugar Mincy. Cause I'm sweet as pie and you sure wanna take a, a bite. The whole room was dead silence. <laughs> Girl, you got no riz. Wonder why you can't date anyone. Everyone was laughing at my face. Luckily, Hajun grabbed my hand and took me out of there. Here's much better. But I couldn't help but thinking how my life had turned upside down because of that imposter. You alright? You don't have to force yourself into a mold that isn't for you. You're special for who you are. And I prefer this you rather than that imposter. I could feel something churning in my stomach. I'm so glad I always have him by my side. The next morning, Su Pin and her clique suddenly came to apologize for laughing at me. But why? Uh, didn't you come back last night and snapped at us? Told us to publicly apologize to you today? I did? So the copycat did come to the karaoke. Did she intentionally stalk me? Later that day, I went to tell Hajun about this. But why did she have to do that? I mean, she tried to stand up for you, right? I don't know. It must be part of her scheme or something. I have to find her ASAP. Suddenly, I got the notification of the Mean Girls live streaming at a cafe. Well, guess who it is, guys? Oh, our little rich lady is a waitress. And she dared to look down on us all the time. She steered her cam towards the poor girl they were talking about. And she looked exactly like me. It's her! Hajun and I immediately rushed to the cafe and saw Su Pin and the imposter was about to jump at each other. What's going on here? Mincy? Wh what? Why are there two Mincy's? <laughs> it's a g -g 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 ghost! Guys, run! You! Who are you? And why did you pretend to be me, you imposter? Mincy, finally we meet. I'm your twin sister. Minha! S sister We're related? But mom and dad never told me I had a long-lost sister. Because you're adopted. They didn't know you had a twin sister who just got adopted before you. You're lying. I'm not. I didn't know this either until my mom was in her final moments. Mom had been sick for a while. So one day she called me to her bed, told me the truth before she drew her last breath. After that, I came to find you. But you were already in the hospital by then. You did wake up after surgery, but once you saw me, you immediately had a seizure and fell back into a coma again. Your parents and I agreed it was best for you if I stayed away and waited until you fully recovered. Meanwhile, you decided to live my life for me? Believe it or not, I actually wanted to know what my long-lost twin sister's like, how she's doing. Turns out you're a very talented comic artist. 
but you're always so insecure, and you're not doing well with the kids at school either, so I wanted to help you out. Sending your webtoon draft, working at the publisher, and fixing those mean girls' wagons, I just went with it and ended up getting too wrapped up. Really, did you get wrapped up in dating a random guy under my name too? And what about school? Did my parents agree to let you replace me? It was my idea and I persuaded them. They're just worried about you. I didn't ask for any of these in the first place. Thanks to you, I've become a stranger to my own life. You're happy now? Then I ran away, never wanting to see her again. Still, the worst part was, my parents lied to me. Why did you do it? You didn't tell me I'm adopted and now you let a stranger replace me? Do you really see me as your child? Minty, honey, of course you're our daughter. Nothing could ever change that. We were afraid you'd be sad if you knew you were adopted. Truthfully, we love you more than you can ever imagine. It's a lot to process, but I had to be strong and stay focused. But soon, whisperings caught my ears. Did you notice Mincy recently is different and even a little bit dull? Where's the cheeky Mincy we're used to? Hey, do you get that bad vibe from Mincy lately? Somehow she'd gone back to being a sullen, creepy nerd again. God, why did everyone keep comparing me to that imposter? Hey, you alright? No, I'm not. Everyone seemed to like Minha and she'd only been here for a month. But nobody cared about me. I do care about you. You always got me. Your handsome friend, ready to the rescue. <laughs> Whatever you say. Come to think of it, your sister only meant well. Despite her way, all she wants is to help you to be more open and show your hidden talents to the world. What Hajun said got me thinking that night. Maybe he's right. If it hadn't been for her, my webtoon would have been forever locked in my iPad. Besides, she's only got me as a family. I've got to see her now. Hey, I came to apologize. I could see you only meant well. And I was only acting ungrateful. I'm sorry. And also, thank you, Uni. There's nothing to be sorry about. It's my fault too for acting on my own and getting myself to fall in love with Si Wu. I haven't told him yet, but I will find the chance. Sorry for dragging you into my stuff. I leapt into her embrace and felt the happy tears running down my cheeks. After the teary reunion, we spend hours catching up with each other. It's like we're reading each other's minds. Must be the twin bond. <laughs> I even invited her to my house and we had a good time. For the next couple days, I only focused on the webtoon and getting to know myself better. With Hajun's help, I now felt more comfortable and confident speaking with others. One day at the publisher, while I was having a little chit-chat break, a colleague rushed in. Minzi, Minzi, did you hear the news? Your webtoon won the first prize of Comic Award. Comic? The most renowned award in webtoon? Oh my god, I'm dreaming, right? My hard work finally bore fruits. I was celebrating with my colleague when out of nowhere, Si Wu dragged me out. You better announce me as the co-author. I helped you with the sketches, the script, the coloring, yada yada yada, remember? What? You were only messing it up. Do you even know what the story is about? Babe, don't challenge me. Or else, I would tell the director, aka my dad, to kick you out. And by the way, let's break up. Excuse me? You really think I like you? Oh, please. I only do it for your webtoon, babe. Ugh, that dandy jerk. I knew he was no good. But what could I do now? Later, I told Minha everything, and she was heartbroken and begged me to help her sneak into Siwoo's office. So I did. Siwoo, please don't leave me. How could I live without you? Oh, it'll be hard, because I'm irresistible. <laughs> but you gotta let go, babe. You have nothing else to offer me. I already know you don't love me, but I do love you. And I already put a love spell on you. You'll forever be haunted by me. <laughs> Then, Minha fainted, crashed on the floor. Scaredy cat Siwoo was freaking out. Hey, hey, you're not gone, right? Suddenly, the light turned off. What in the Holy Spirit's going on? The light turned on again, and the guy stopped screaming until he saw me. Hi, babe. Ah, what, why are, what are you? You don't recognize me? It's me, Minji, in spirit form. Stay the heck away from me. After every despicable thing you've done to me. Please, please. Come with me, you crooked. To, to, where? To the other side. He was so scared his eyes went white. Then he fainted. <laughs> Serves you right. And let me introduce my Ekip with Minha, who should win Oscars for that performance. And Hajun, who's behind the light effect. Didn't think of that, did you? After that, Siwoo kept insisting I was some spiritual force that haunted this place. Then eventually, he quit the job. 
And of course, I had the full copyright of my webtoon and was eligible to receive the comic award. My career has just begun as I decided to continue to work at Blackwood. Mom and Dad also decided to adopt Minha into our family, and we could finally be together. That's the magic I wanted to tell you. This unexpected event changed my life for the better. Chance doesn't come twice, right? You have to grasp it. By the way, I want to ask, do you guys have any unexpected events that changed your entire life? Tell us in the comments below. Hang on, here's one more thing I have to do for the old shy me. Hajun, uh, I've been wanting to tell you something. The past event got me thinking, if I don't start telling you how I feel now, I might regret it later. So, Kim Hajun, I like you. So, so much. Finally, it took you that long. When you were in hospital, you weren't the Minzi I knew, which freaked me out thinking what if I couldn't see the real you anymore. It's comforting that you're still here, because I got a huge crush on you too. It was the last lap and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me and I could see the finish line coming close, so I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. Suddenly I heard a weird noise coming from the engine and lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. Hi, I'm Natalie and it's me behind that wheel. You may be wondering how I got myself into that situation, so let's begin from the start. I was born into a racing family, so the passion for sports naturally ran in my veins. But my life somehow resembled Maggie Payton in the movie Herbie, as my dad didn't allow me to race. Instead, he put all his faith in my adopted brother, Jeremy, and by pouring everything he knew into teaching him, with a hope that he'd become a great racer. Only the explanation to this wasn't as complex as in the movie. My mom passed away when I was a newborn, but no vehicle accident was involved. It's just my dad was of the opinion that, Ladies should be gentle and sweet. So he forbade me from participating in racing or anything even remotely dangerous. Despite that, growing up with Jeremy by my side was truly a blessing. Although not related by blood, we were very close. Jeremy often let me take the wheel of his race car without dad knowing, and he even taught me all he had learned from dad. Over time, I was able to catch up to him in terms of racing prowess. Today, he had a big race, and as usual, I went to his room to check on him. But he was still in bed. His face was pale, and obviously, he was in pain. Jeremy, what's wrong? I think I got food poisoning from that gas station hot dog. Gosh, just drop it. You can't drive in this condition. I can't. This is the qualifying round for the championship season. Dad will be so disappointed in me. So, there's only one way. Hey, I can drive in your place. Are you crazy, Natty? Blah! Jesus, see? There's no time. Under the racing gear, nobody can tell us apart. He was reluctant for a while, but finally gave in. So here I am, in a super cool appearance. I felt a wave of exhilaration that sent me sprinting to the track. Passing other racers with deft accuracy, I left trails of smoke in my wake as I smoothly swerved into the tight turns. When I reached the final lap, I gave it my all and finished in first place. Yippee! I got back to the waiting area after the race, then was suddenly dragged away. Hey, Jeremy's here. I'm all right now. Just want to make sure you made it out okay. Congrats on first place. Thank you. Now switch clothes with me. They need to see your face on the podium. As Jeremy raised up the trophy, I couldn't help but imagine myself in his place, overcome with happiness. That evening, the race was replayed on TV. Jeremy, your style is different today. You finally understood how to drive more freely. I've always said you have potential, yet you don't have the guts to shatter limitations. But if you keep racing like that, we may need to get you another trophy shelf. Uh, yes, I'll try. You were really cool today. Keep up the good work. After that race, I still felt the electric rush lingering in my bones. So I asked Jeremy to let me keep taking his place. Enough, Natty. Last time I did it as a last resort. You don't really want to be a racer anyway. Let me help you. In the meantime, you can focus on your passion. Seeing him hesitate, I continued. If you're afraid of being caught, just be there at all times so we can swap back whenever we need to. Jeremy's Jeremy. Couldn't say no to my puppy eyes. After that, I wore Jeremy's racing suit and entered all of his competitions. During that time, Jeremy would covertly hide among the crowd and wait. Oh, did I mention that my brother is a huge crochet fanatic? He even runs an Etsy business stocked with incredible pieces he made all by himself. Things were going kind of smoothly, but public practice was out of the question because we had to keep this a secret from dad. So Jeremy's plan was for me to pretend to be dating the team mechanic, Royce, also his best friend. This would give me an excuse to go to the track on a regular basis to practice. The following day, Jeremy took me to meet Royce, and luckily he was so friendly and agreed to assist us right away. 
Although balancing school and racing was hard, I still nailed it beautifully. At school, nobody knew I came from a racing family as we never appeared together in public. Not to brag, but a lot of guys were smitten with me. However, this dude, Liam, stood out. He's actually Jeremy's biggest racing rival, so I couldn't help but laugh internally as he made many attempts at wooing me in school. If you were a vegetable, you'd be a cute cumber. Just to turn green with envy at me on the racetrack, as he had no idea it was me under this costume. <laughs> it made sense, given he hadn't lost to Jeremy this many times before. Yeah! Hey, Jeremy, what's your deal? Your racing style has changed so drastically. Just then, a staff member from our team turns to me. Yeah, and you've been really quiet lately. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm just focusing on the competition. And so this began my official rivalry between Liam and I. We were racing neck and neck, but all of a sudden my engine died and stopped in the middle of the track. I watched as a few cars zoomed past me and Liam took the win. My win. Seeing that dude get out of his car and reveal his smug face had my blood boiling. The next week, I was in another race to make up for last week's fiasco, but this time I had a flat tire. Were the racing gods against me beating Liam? Due to my recent losing streak, some of my sponsors threatened to have their sponsorship withdrawn if I don't win the next race. So this time, I got Royce to double check, no, triple check that the car was ready to race. I scrutinized every nook and cranny, same as the last few races. If something goes wrong again, then my guess is that you have a petty guy willing to sabotage you. My next race was going well, but on the last lap, as I reached a tight turn, I pressed on the brake and my car was not slowing down. Time seemed to slow as the wall rushed closer. My palms clenched the steering wheel. It was a dance of split-second decisions and instinct, but I managed to swerve, the tire screeching in protest as I narrowly avoided disaster. Close shave. I looked over to the finish line and saw that Liam had once again secured first place. He was definitely behind this. So I quickly got changed and barged into Liam's waiting room to confront him. Oh, my angel. What are you doing in this fiery battlefield? It's you who played tricks on me, my brother, right? Spit it out. Your brother? Who? Jeremy Wilson? You sabotaged someone else's car too, or what? What are you talking about? Drop the act. You're the one who benefits the most if my brother loses. Recently, his car kept breaking down. This can't be a coincidence. It just seems like luck is on my side. See, the girl I like also happens to come from a famous racing family. We're a match made in heaven. How can you be so casual about this? Don't you know how dangerous it is to drive with broken brakes? If not for my driving skills, I would have been injured. Wait, your driving skills? Were you the one driving the car? Um, I mean, my brother. Oh my god, it's you! I knew something's off lately. Watch your tongue. I, I didn't say anything. Focus on the actual conversation. You either confess to the crime or I will investigate and expose your true face to the whole world. Mark my words. I couldn't believe I just let my secret slip to my biggest rival. If Jeremy knew this, he'd definitely tell me to quit racing. So after a sleepless night, I decided to meet Liam for a proper talk, but he found me first. Are you Google? Cause you have everything I'm searching for. Stop messing around. I'm not done with you yet. The you broke my car case? I had no idea about it, I swear. I'm competitive, but not that low. But isn't it normal for a car to suddenly break down sometimes? Put that aside. Anyway, have you told anyone about my identity yet? No, but what's up with that? I want you to keep your mouth shut. So let's make a deal. What do you want? Except for a date like in some sappy rom-coms, of course. Then nothing. Just don't avoid me anymore. And tell me why you have to disguise as your brother. That's none of your business. All right, then I'll ask someone else. Ugh, fine. Just promise you won't tell anyone. Then I told Liam everything. And since that day, he had officially become my shadow, no matter at school or on the track. I need to complain to Spotify for not naming you this week's hottest single. Oh, wow, they really look cute together. Even though they're competitors, love always wins. And that's how we accidentally became a gay couple in the racing scene. At first, I found Liam very annoying, but soon I realized his great passion for racing matched my own, and his insights into the racing world were unexpectedly captivating. I found myself opening up to Liam, sharing my thoughts and feelings with ease, and somehow felt happy around him. But the mystery around my broken car hadn't unfolded, so I couldn't let my guard down. And here comes the last qualifying match before the championships. My dad was also here today to motivate everyone. 
I was so nervous, yet still had to act lovey-dovey with Royce in front of Dad. Obviously, Liam wasn't happy about that. He kept coming in between us, even though he knew we were just pretending. Natalie, focus! I couldn't stand to keep my secret any longer, so I gotta carry the day to prove myself, then reveal the truth to him and race under my own identity. I turned on the engine's full power and felt its huge force as I raced. My helmet fought the wind, and the air surge was like a thrilling symphony. It was the last lap, and I was in the final stretch. There was only one car ahead of me, Liam's car, and I could see the finish line coming close. So, I pushed on the acceleration as far as it could go. As I raced past him, I was both precise and fast. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could feel an adrenaline rush through my body. Suddenly, a strange sound came from my car, and I lost control at once. The car started spinning like crazy and off the track onto the grass. I was dizzy, but lucky enough, not a scratch. As I came to, the first person I saw was Liam? He dropped everything just to check that I was okay. He took me to my pit stop, where my teammates rushed over to support. Suddenly, my dad appeared. I was panicking, and I didn't know where to go or hide when... Natalie, no need to hide anymore. I already know. <sighs> How? That doesn't matter. Look at you. What a mess. I just wanted to prove to you that I can do it. This is my passion. Why do you always stop me? Your passion? You mean falling off the track? You just ignored all the times I'd won first place. You're a terrible, selfish, evil father who has no love for your children and always forces others to do this, do that. People don't respect you because they want to. Everyone only listens to you because they're afraid of you, just like me and Jeremy. Just then, Dad slapped me hard across the cheek. I stumbled back and fell onto Liam. It was you, wasn't it? I, I I'm sorry. I just couldn't watch you get yourself in danger anymore. Meeting you is my entire life's greatest regret. Before anyone could see me cry, I ran away. I have nothing left. No one understands me. No one. I lay there in my room, consumed by a cloud of gloom after Dad's week-long grounding. Suddenly, a pebble knocked at my window. It was Liam. He was trying to throw a rope up to me. After a moment of hesitation, I finally climbed down. I'm sorry I went behind your back. I didn't know your dad would go that far. I care about you and just want you to be safe. But now I realize the way to do that is to find the true culprit who vandalized your car. Liam's apology felt really sincere. Look at him. I couldn't stay mad forever. The last time you raced, you never left your car side. The pre-checks are where we need to look into. Are you sure you can fully trust this Royce guy? He's my brother's best friend. Why would he sabotage me? You're just being subjective. Suddenly, a memory resurfaced in me. <gasps> Last week, I saw Royce lingering around the car for longer than the usual inspection. He told me that I need a new head gasket or else I wouldn't be able to accelerate without blowing the engine. Now, when I think of it, it seems kind of fishy. So we rushed to Royce's shop immediately. Natalie, what are you doing here? I'm sorry to hear things have been rough between you and your dad. But you're not sorry for almost taking my life? What are you talking about? Cut the act. I've got all the evidence against you. What evidence? Shut up. I have CCTV footage of your criminal acts. If I give it to the racing committee, you'll be out for good. What do you think? My hands were trembling as I hoped that Royce couldn't see through my bluff. But shockingly, Royce's face went pale and he crumbled to the ground. All right, Natalie, it's me. But I didn't mean to hurt you. I just want to help Jeremy. How does that help Jeremy? Actually, I have a crush on him and Jeremy confided in me once. I don't know what to do. I love Natalie very much, but I always feel self-conscious in front of her. I'm just an adopted child. Becoming a racer is all that my dad wishes for me. If I stop racing, he won't love me anymore. Meanwhile, Natalie's far better than me from the beginning. If dad finds out I'm such a loser, he will disown me. Jeremy, my poor brother. I just wanted to scare you into not racing. Everything I did to your car was carefully deliberated beforehand so that you wouldn't get hurt. I'm sorry. I'll find a way to fix everything. I got home later that night, only to hear arguing from the living room. What you did to Natalie was unfair. You kept her from doing what she loves, just like me. I've never dared to admit this, but now, Dad, racing isn't my passion. This is. What? But you find it too girly, right? Actually, I just race to please you. And only this simple thing makes me happy. Unable to stand by, I interjected, revealing how Jeremy was living in so much fear among his own family. They were shocked for a moment. Then Dad said, Jeremy, it's all my fault to put so much pressure on you and make you feel like you weren't loved enough. You're always my son, no matter if you choose racing or not. 
And Natalie, I'm sorry for hitting you. The pain on your cheek may have gone, but still lingers in my hand. I just didn't want to risk losing you. I never told you this, but when your mother was pregnant with you, she got sick, and I could have lost both of you when she went into labor. Ever since that day, I swore to keep you safe, alive, and healthy. Dad, I love you, but I love racing too. I hope that I can count on your support on the track. Then I revealed that Royce was the one who sabotaged my car. They were both shocked and furious, especially Jeremy. But after being told a full story, they decided to forgive Royce as he showed his remorse by confessing his crime and was temporarily suspended. We had not seen him since then. True compassion lies not only in caring for someone, but also in caring for them in the right way. Misguided intentions can unintentionally sow the seeds of unintended consequences. Finally, I could officially join the race using my own name. Dad came to see me today as well. He seemed quite concerned, but encouraged me anyway. Suddenly, Liam approached me. If I win this time, fair and square, would you go on a date with me? You have no chance to win, but a date? You earned it. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea, but people here call me Fei Fei. Please like and subscribe. My life was extra special because I had two home countries. Even though I was born in China, during our trip to America when I was seven, I got lost from my family. At first, I was really scared and lonely, but the more time I spent in the orphanage, the stronger and more independent I became. It seemed like this place was filled with my greatest childhood memories. Life went on just fine, until I was 15. A miracle happened. Fei Fei! Daddy finally found you! I didn't fully understand how, but tears started streaming down my face. Dad didn't change one bit, but my mom had passed away. So I was introduced to my stepmom, May. Our family's finally reunited! Let's get back to China. I sadly waved my friends goodbye and returned to my home country. We, the Li family, came from a long line of pottery makers. And this is the fifth generation. Dad said that before his grandparents took their last breath, their dying wish was to preserve the family craft. And as the only granddaughter of the family, I carried the noble responsibility of inheriting this pottery shop. I believe in you. Make us proud. While I was still processing everything, my parents already dragged me to my relative's house for a meet and greet. There must have been 20 people here, and I had to memorize all their names? Grandpa Zhu, Grandma Lian, Uncle Tang, and Aunt... Aunt Hua? Luckily, I still remembered some simple phrases from my childhood and greeted them with my broken Chinese. Then, I heard them talking about a robbery at my house a couple days ago. Dad got a big order to polish 12 vases for the Ming Dynasty, but they were nowhere to be found all of a sudden. The customer wanted to press charges, causing a big trouble for our family. The police were involved, but since all cameras were smashed, it was impossible to find the culprit. The detective in me was woken up, so I ran to where my aunts were to eavesdrop. But before I could ask anything, Dad came and dragged me away. It's none of your business, kiddo. Even if the police couldn't solve it yet, focus on learning the trade. A few days later, I started school. And boy, I thought I was smart, but Chinese characters defeated me. For crying out loud, those dancing letters and accents gave me a nightmare. And I was even reprimanded for using English in class. That's not all. Classes were followed immediately by ceramic lessons. Watching ceramic tutorials was fun, but practicing was a hard slap of reality. The more I practiced throwing clay, the more stupid shapes I created. Ugh, and there's clay all over my face and shirt. Clumsy me. Frustrated, I angrily yeeted a piece of clay across the room, then saw Dad glaring at me with his face darkened. Fei Fei just came here. She can't possibly learn that quickly. Give her some time. But Dad coldly dragged me to the ceramic gallery. You know, pottery is about pouring souls into lifeless clay. Your great-grandfather used to make ceramics for the palace during the Qing Dynasty. In wartime, the whole workshop was bombed, but your great-grandparents saved the most precious vases while fleeing the enemy till they died. Dad's words made me realize how hasty and incompetent I was. I had to change! Then Dad introduced me to a guy. This is Cody, my best apprentice, aka Pottery Prodigy. He'll be your teacher. Cody's American, so communication was much easier. He's a great teacher who would always patiently fix my work to perfection, despite how many times I messed up. Cody's also friendly and easy to talk to. Some days our deep talks lasted until dawn. One time, while I was preparing the kiln, I accidentally found this half-burnt piece of paper in the corner. It looked not so normal because there was some handwriting that seemed important on it. I showed Cody and he said it could be a Chinese poem, but I couldn't figure out its meaning since most of it was lost. Dad said it was nonsense while my stepmom shook her head in confusion. 
but it somehow still bothered me, so I kept studying it for a few nights, and I might have found a clue that could lead to the mysterious missing 12 phases! But that wasn't enough, so I decided to put it aside for now. Back to my daily routine. I was showered in my neighbor's and relatives' care. A bit too much. They always urged me to get married. When I was your age, I had two children already. <laughs> but I'm not even 18 yet. Worse, they even sent some suitors to my house. I've got a gift for you for our first meeting. This chicken lays a lot of eggs. If you marry me, your life will be full of roses. I only have one small request. My family wants many children, so we'll need to have five sons, three daughters, and a pair of twins. They got me dizzy, so I sneaked out the back door to avoid running into another lunatic. <sighs> the countryside sunset looked so peaceful. Arr! Wow, didn't expect such strong pipes from a tiny body. Creepy much? I turned to leave, but suddenly that guy grabbed my ponytail and pulled out my hair tie. I was gonna teach this jerk a lesson, but he somehow dodged every blow. Stand still so I could hit you. Give me a kiss, then I'll give it back. You wish? What a psycho! But somehow, now I and this psycho became friends, and we even got closer and closer after seeing each other every day at school. I realized Kai wasn't as annoying as I thought, and even grew sympathy for him when I learned that he also lost his mother when he was little. As his father was busy running his business, Kai was always unhappy and lonely. Now that he had my company, he cheered me up whenever I was sad and frustrated about not getting better at pottery. However, Cody didn't seem too pleased with this. He appeared out of nowhere and dragged me away. Faye, that guy is a notorious lady killer. Stay away from him. He seems like just a regular dude to me. Okay, to tell you the truth, that guy is from the Wen family, our lifelong nemesis. If your dad knew about this, you're done. I'm a bit concerned, but life isn't a revenge drama. No one can stop me from seeing someone because of some familial feud. Still, I guess I should be careful. Hey, hey, what you hiding? Faye likes a free spirit. A boring guy only plays with clay all day. <clears throat> no chance. Well, I think an innocent girl like Faye needs a calm, mature, and collected guy. Not some free-spirited, spoiled rich boy who only knows how to spend his parents' money. Ah! Every time this happened, I had to throw myself in between them and push them apart. One day, my stepmom caught me coming home after going out with Kai. I panicked and didn't know how to explain, but don't worry. Your secret's safe with me. You're stressed out enough. Then she called me in for a deep talk. She apologized for not giving me enough care and kindly asked if I had any difficulties since returning home. Hmm. Actually, I like pottery, but I haven't improved no matter how hard I worked. The responsibility on my shoulders is so big that it pulls me down. I tried to put up a smile, but there were times that I felt suffocated. Don't push yourself too hard. If it's all too much, take a break and go back to America for a while. A healthy mind comes first and foremost. Wah! <sighs> I'm so lucky to have an understanding stepmother. As soon as she left, Cody stepped out. I didn't know you were under so much pressure. Don't worry, there are other ways to help your family besides making good pottery. You're smart, I know you can do it. So, I started to practice performing tricks with ceramic faces, then set up a TikTok account to upload videos of my performances. They went viral in only a few weeks, gathering millions of views and propelled the pottery shop to fame. And with that, the number of orders grew rapidly. The national pottery competition was coming. My dad excitedly announced that it was a huge opportunity for our family. Our core team worked day and night to create a unique design that would make an impact. The big day finally arrived and I was tasked with carrying the vase to the exhibition area. I was so excited to be there, but a stranger suddenly bumped into me, leaving me in shock for a few seconds. Oh my god, the vase! Panicked, I hurriedly checked and luckily, it's okay. Whew, that was close. The competition officially began. I checked out the other displays. They all looked splendid, but the Wen's family vase literally shocked me to my core. It looked exactly like ours. I went straight there to confront them. This is clearly my family's design. You, you shameless thieves. Watch your mouth, little girl. And you, keep an eye on your daughter. Don't let her bring shame to your family. Don't tell me how to raise my child. And the vase, the thief will soon be exposed. Come on, Faye. I knew the design can be copied, but not the material. It's made with our family's secret technique. We had a special substance that made ceramics more durable. Now we just need a little luck. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner impressed us with its one-of-a-kind design and outstanding quality. The first prize goes to... Wen Family! 
However, we also found out one team's product is made with substandard material and underfired. The judges also suspect them of plagiarizing the Wen's design. We can't accept such disrespect to the craft. Lee family, you're disqualified from this competition. Before we could recover from this shock, the news already spread like wildfire. Kai tried to explain that he had nothing to do with this, but I didn't want anything to do with him anymore. The Wen family must have made a copy of our vase and swapped it with ours. But when? It's with me the whole time. It could only be... Our business took a nosedive. Orders were cancelled, most staff quit, and worse still, everyone here suspected that I swapped the vases since some of them saw me with Kai. My dad didn't take that news so well. He had a stroke and was hospitalized ASAP. No, I had to find out the truth, no matter what. Only three people knew the design. Dad, Cody, and me. Right, Cody would know what to do now. Unfortunately, he took some days off to take care of his sick mom, so I decided to come to him again. He'd gone shopping, so his mom welcomed me. Thank you for giving my son a chance and paying him handsomely. Without the money, I might not even be here anymore. <coughs> money? What money? Ah, uh, my son spent sleepless nights for months to complete your vase. Isn't that why you paid him that well? What? We'd never made Cody work overtime. What money is she talking about? Right then, Cody got home. I immediately confronted him. He denied everything at first, but then he had to give in. Who hired you? Really, I don't know. They texted me from a blocked number, then wire transferred me the money. Faye, my mom's really sick and I had no choice. I never expect such terrible consequences. I'm so sorry, Fei Fei. I ran away ASAP. I can't hear another word. The saddest thing about betrayal is that it never comes from your enemy. When I got home, my stepmom was cooking. Oh my, you look pale. Poor sweetie. I couldn't help but leaped into her arms and burst into tears. She tried to calm me down before bringing dad his food. I know I cannot be weak anymore. I'll find out who's behind all this. Whatever it takes. I rummaged through the workshop until late, only to find nothing. Exhausted, I went to sit by the gate for some fresh air and suddenly saw something in the bush. An envelope. Looks fishy. To not leave any trace, I opened it with steam instead of tearing. It's a Chinese poem and had the same style as the one I found the other day. By reading the first letter in each line, I got this message. Yo, Chang. Jin, Mian, meet at the oil factory, it is. The message coded in the other poem also referred to a place. It's gotta be a sketchy meeting to have its spot written in code like that. I quickly put the letter back and searched for the only oil factory in town, then followed the address to an abandoned factory. I ran straight inside, but it was totally empty. Was I wrong? I felt defeated and was about to leave when I suddenly heard a voice from the second floor. I crept up and saw Kai's father with a gang wearing black and our 12 stolen vases. Right then, a hand patted on my shoulder. Whatcha doing? I turned around to see a creepy face, then pitch black. I opened my eyes with a splitting headache and my hands all tied up. Who's this? My stepmother, who's arm in arm with Kai's father? Already awake? You, you're on their side? My father didn't mistreat you. This is how you return the favor? I've had enough of your old man. A tyrant and self-proclaimed smart man. I deserve someone who loves and pampers me, like Mr. Wen here. If your father had been truly smart, he would have realized long ago that he had nurtured a serpent in his bosom. That Cody boy. <laughs> Just wait and see. I will expose your scheming. Ha! In your dream! I already bought a plane ticket back to America. Be prepared to be welcomed by another orphanage. I even wrote your old man a touching welfare letter. He'll definitely have another stroke once he reads it. <laughs> the secret letter has exposed you, and other evidence will soon be found. You can't get away with this. Do you mean this, feisty girl? In fact, what letter? <laughs> Just then, the wind blew and swept the burning letter to some old oil containers at the corner, setting it aflame. The fire spread with lightning speed. They all ran for their lives, leaving me behind. The smoke was thick, stinging my eyes. <coughs> I was about to faint when... Cody kicked the door open, dashed in, and untied me, while Kai covered me with his jacket. You? You? There's no time. Run! Then quickly carried me away from the fire. When we got to safety, the entire factory exploded. Okay, can you two explain everything now? I... I felt guilty about the pottery competition, so I secretly followed my father to find out the truth for you. I came to your house to apologize, but saw you rushing somewhere looking worried. That's why I decided to follow you. 
and I can't believe that the person hiring me is your stepmother. Me neither. Anyway, thanks. But I'm still mad at you. Are, Are you, you okay, okay now? now? I'm fine. I'm not sure about them, though. Animators, please replay the previous scene. Yep, I managed to record everything. With this priceless evidence, of course my so-called stepmother and Wen had to plead guilty and go to prison. My father was discharged from the hospital, and our 12 ceramic vases were returned. Now that our family's name's cleared, business is booming. After this incident, I learned to cherish our pottery workshop more. Determined to continue my family business, I started learning pottery properly to prepare for next year's competition. Root for me, peeps! And, of course, I still have these two guys by my side. Only, it looks like they no longer want to just be friends with me. What should I do? Please help me by commenting down below if you're hashtag Team Kai or hashtag Team Cody. I was sound asleep when loud bangings jolted me awake. The cops busted in and immediately pinned me down. What are you doing? Let me go! Get away from me! Do you even know who I am? Rebecca Darlington, you're under arrest for stealing Mr. Woodley Jones's heirloom necklace. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Stealing? What? No, I didn't do it. Let me go. Man, I got into big trouble that time. Oh, hey guys, I'm Rebecca. Believe it or not, it's actually my bizarre life story here. Before we start, please like and subscribe. My dad passed away when I was only five, so my mom had to step up and take over the entire family business on her own. And she was the biggest perfectionist on the planet, not just in business, but in the family too. Seriously, it's her way or no way. I hated this and always tried to rebel. However, mom always found a way to ruin my fun and forced me to study business instead. Ah, <sighs> boring. But lucky me, my brother, Kevin, always got my back. One morning over breakfast, mom decided to drop a bombshell on me. Rebecca, I've arranged you a date with Brian, the Woodley Jones's son. You are to go there for dinner and be on your best behavior. They are very affluent. They own half of the city. No chance. I'm not some pawn in your bid to gain business deals. If you ignore my orders, I'll transfer you to a boarding school all the way to Australia. You wouldn't. Don't test me, young lady. Perhaps you could arrange this date for another time when Rebecca has a time to digest it? If I wanted your input, I would have asked for it. He's my brother, and he has a say in this. Your adopted brother. It's about time he knows his place. Kevin looked so hurt, but still put a smile on for me. He's such an angel, just like his mom, Rosalie. Rosalie used to work here as a maid, and Kevin would often come play with me. But then she suddenly passed away, leaving Kevin all alone in this world. So mom adopted him out of pity. To me, Kevin's always been a family, and I will not let mom treat him like that. How about I let her have a taste of her own medicine? So I took mom's magic money card and went on a huge shopping splurge. Mom wouldn't be mad if her card missed a few zeros, right? Now let's get ready for the date. Ta-da! I look crazy, right? Take that, mom. No way will this Brian guy want a second date. Kevin kindly offered to drive me to my date. He reassured me it would be okay, then passed me a box of chocolates to give to Brian. Ugh, oh, Kevin. It was gone 9 p.m. when I strolled into the grand entrance hall of the Woodley Joneses' mansion. Brian's jaw dropped to the floor as soon as he saw my crazy look. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I first asked all the surfers to leave us alone, then made him nauseous with my table manners and wowed him with my big appetite. I even sneaked bites of the chocolates meant for him and playfully fed him some. After dinner, I asked him to give me a tour of the mansion. But by the time we reached the jewelry room, my head was spinning. Then everything went blurry and I blacked out. The next morning, I was already back at my house without any memories of how I got back. Then these cops came in and arrested me. Now I'm in this interrogation room being accused of stealing the Woodley Jones necklace. Apparently, it was quite pricey and had been handed down through 12 generations. You were at the scene of the crime. If you want to prove your innocence, then I suggest you start telling me what happened. Like I said, I went there for dinner, then fainted, and somehow woke up in my bed with cops everywhere. Stop lying. Brian was the one who was drugged, during which time you cut off the power so you wouldn't be caught on CCTV, then stole the necklace, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Policeman. Daniel Wright, I know you're trying to play good cop, bad cop with me, so I'll get to the point. Let me go, and I will ask my mom to pay you handsomely. You know her, right? Head of the Darlington conglomerate? Are you trying to bribe to law enforcement? You could get seven years in jail for this, plus the robbery sentence. I can assure you it wouldn't be less than ten years. T ten years? I, I didn't mean to. I just freaked out. I I'm rich, okay? I have everything I want. 
I, I wouldn't risk stealing something like that. You did send all the staff home, so there was no one to corroborate your story. How exactly did you get home? I told you I blacked out. All I know is I didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't find the necklace at my place or on me either. You have no evidence against me. Then enjoy stay in a cell for 24 hours, in which time I shall find the proof I need to lock you away for a very long time. Wait, no, please trust me. Someone, anyone. This was so unfair. I just wanted to go home. Fortunately, that cop couldn't find any proof and had to let me go. Finally, after 24 hours behind cold bars, unjustly accused, all I need right now is a warm welcome from Mom and Kevin and a nice bath. But what I got was a slap in the face. How could you steal from the Woodley Joneses? Now they'll never do business with me again. Mom, I didn't do it. Why does nobody believe me? Would you look at yourself? Have you done anything good for this family? All you ever did was party, throw my hard-earned money out the window, then dare to cross me. You're no daughter of mine. Get out, now! I was shocked and heartbroken by her words. My own mother wouldn't believe me? So, I walked out. Just you wait, Mom. I'll prove it to you. I'm no thief. With Kevin's help, I rented a place not too far from home, but it was nowhere near the luxury I was used to. No worries. Once I proved myself innocent, things would get better. Now I just had to find that police guy, Daniel, that arrested me. He must have insight on the case, right? But when I arrived at the police station, I saw Daniel being scolded by his boss. You couldn't even solve the simplest case. Daniel, what has gotten into you? You're off the case. Jack, it's over to you. Leave it with me, sir. I won't let you down. Like some incompetence. <laughs> Sheesh, that Jack guy was such a douchebag. And Daniel sure did look glum about all of this. So I approached him and suggested we work together to find the culprit and kick Jack in the butt. At first, he refused, as apparently a suspect participating in the investigation was not procedure. Relax, it's not like I want access to classified documents or anything. Think of it as working with a suspect. If we cooperate, you can monitor me to see if I really am the culprit. It's a win-win. It's not like that. I'm no longer on the case. Jeez, I didn't expect you to give up so easily. So much for being a pro. Maybe your boss was right to reassign the case. <laughs> Who are you to judge me? You're still the number one suspect in this case, and I got my eyes on you, thief. So, is that a yes? Ugh, fine. Bingo. Surely there's no place better to hunt for clues than the crime scene, right? But Brian's mansion was locked down and had security everywhere. Luckily, Daniel told me he'd already studied the house's layout and knew that the only way to intrude without being noticed was through this door. Yes, folks, you heard it right. A dog door. The bar couldn't get any lower, could it? Just shut up. We sneaked through it and ended up in the staff kitchen. The main building has already been fully swept, as that's where we knew the main suspect was. The staff quarters weren't a focus point. Daniel launched into a CSI mode, checking the area for footprints, and I watched with fascination. He found a strange shoe print, which didn't belong to any of the staff, as they were required to wear uniform shoes. This type of shoe print is rare. This could be a big clue. I didn't want him to start accusing me again, so I wiggled my foot about. Ahem, <clears throat> it's obviously not my tiny size six feet. <laughs> I didn't say a thing about you. This obviously belonged to a man with size 12 feet. Is it your accomplice? Is he Bigfoot or something? Are you crazy? Who's accomplice, you madcap? Shush, are you trying to get us caught? Oopsie, just then, we heard running footsteps coming our way. Shoot, we gotta get out. The only escape is through this window. Again? Oh, what a burden. Daniel grabbed my hand, then we both jumped through the window. Smack, his shoe was right up my face. Ouch, get your dirty foot off me. I tried getting up and we ended up kissing. My my first kiss. Wait, what is that sound? I turned around to see two big dogs growling at us. We run on the count of three, okay? One, just run! We ran straight to the road and caught a taxi, leaving behind those vicious dogs. Uh, your hand, um. Oh, sorry, it was because of those dogs. Is being chased by dogs the in-trend? A few nights ago, I saw those exact two dogs chasing another man along this road. Daniel immediately asked the driver to show him his dashcam footage. It showed this tall, masked man in all black coming out of Brian's house. A shiver ran through me at the sight of him. There was something unsettlingly familiar. The next day, Daniel made me traipse into at least a dozen different shoe stores so he could ask the staff about the soul print we'd found last night, but no luck. 
the scorching sun was getting to me, so Daniel brought out this umbrella. Cute, huh? If only this big hole hadn't been directly above me. By lunchtime, I saw Daniel sweating in the heat, so I grabbed a tissue to wipe for him. The heat rose as we were so close, but once done, he was even more oily. <laughs> we were just like two peas in a pod. Later that day, we made it to this ancient shoe shop that said it was a Leighton, a brand that made customized handmade shoes. Wait, I've heard about that exclusive brand before, but... If someone could afford these shoes, why would they go out and about stealing? Daniel seemed to agree, and the investigation was at a dead end. The truth is, I had my suspicions about who the real thief was, so I went back to the crime scene to see if I could find any evidence. Daniel did say this dog door was the only other way in, so I searched around the area and spotted this shiny bracelet in a bush. Oh, I know who this belongs to. So, I've asked him to meet me here. I found your bracelet. Thank you so much. You know how important this is to me. The bracelet is a keepsake for my mom. She gave it to me before she passed away. I found it at Brian's house. The night you drove me to Brian's, did you go straight home afterward? Y yeah, of course. I've been on the investigation for a couple of days and found that the thief wore size 12 latent shoes. I gave you a pair for your birthday. The thief was also identified by a taxi driver's dash cam as a male, around 5 foot 10, the exact body figure of you. And now, this bracelet? The coincidences are stacking up. But I can't believe it. Not without your explanation. After all, you are my brother. Yes, it was me, but I had no other choice. I actually have a sister, a half-sister from my dad's side, and she's going through surgery. I really needed the money to pay her bills. I might look successful on the outside, but I work for your mom unpaid. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for all she's done for me, and I couldn't ask her for more, so I took the risk. Why didn't you tell me? I can help you. You were always embroiled in arguments with your mom, so I don't want to burden you further. And you only seem to need me when you're in trouble. That's true. Thinking back, we rarely talked. Even when we talked, it was always me complaining about mom to him without realizing mom has been the hardest on him. I hated what he did, but I knew he only did it to save his sister, and I felt terrible that I'd had Kevin's love and care all of these years, and she hadn't. Kevin, don't worry. Just leave it to me. The next day, Daniel came to see me and told me the police department had just found new evidence against me. The chocolates I'd given to Brian that night contained anesthetics. It all sounds very suspicious to me and may just change the direction of my investigation. Are you investigating me now? No, it's highly possible that the real culprit wanted to target you. I need your cooperation. We have to hurry before they blame it all on you. Who helped you prepare the present that day? No one. I bought them at the store. I felt awful lying to Daniel, but I couldn't let Kevin go down for this. Not when his sister needed him. It was time for me to put an end to this devastating chain of events. I went to the police station and confessed to stealing the necklace. They arrested me, and right at that moment, Daniel stepped in, surprised. Rebecca, what are you doing here? Let her go! What are you doing? We can't arrest her without evidence. Daniel, it's okay. I already confessed. What? That's nonsense. I insisted that I did it, and he had no choice but to let them arrest me. I know it's not that simple, Rebecca, and I'm going to prove it. Daniel was right. Everything was off about this trial. First, this Jack guy had somehow swapped all the evidence against Kevin to me, from my shoe prints on the staff kitchen to the recording from the taxi driver. Plus, the necklace was later found in Miss Rebecca Darlington's bedroom. It was never there in the first place. I wanted to speak up for myself, but that douchebag Jack shut me up. The judge was about to sentence me when Daniel kicked the door and barged in. Stop, Your Honor. I believe all the evidence presented to you was faked by him. The whole court bursted out in surprise. Turns out Daniel's boss had suspected Jack was a rotten apple, so he actually wanted to use this chance to expose him. He pretended to kick Daniel out of the case and appointed Jack instead to lure him into the trap. As predicted, after I confessed to the crime, Daniel followed Jack and saw that he was taking bribes from Kevin. Well paid. I'll fake the evidence. Rebecca will go down for this. Don't mess it up. It's tricky enough to get that brat to take the blame for me. He played me? There was no half-sister who's in the hospital? Ugh, don't look at me like that. My real mom only died because of your mom, Don Darlington. That woman flagrantly accused her of stealing. Mom was so distraught, she had a heart attack and... and passed away. Don only adopted me out of guilt, and she treated me like garbage making me run around for you. So I decided to take revenge, show them how being wrongly accused of something can ruin lives. But look where vengeance got him. He was a monster, and I really wondered, was it really worth it?
In the end, both Jack and Kevin went to jail. Unfortunately, without Kevin as key personnel to help out with my family business, it went into turmoil. So I offered to help mom with it. You do that after everything I put you through. We're a family. I also felt bad for taking you and what you provide me for granted. I'm so ashamed of how I treated you. I've been cold, controlling, and unfair on you and Kevin. It's my fault he turned against us and sought revenge. Mom, it must have been hard for you running the business and caring for me and Kevin, especially without Dad. I forgive you and want to just put it behind us and start again. Now, I just had one last person to make amends with. Rebecca, I... I didn't think you'd ever want to see me again. I didn't. I was so mad, but then I realized that being that way was getting me nowhere. To forgive others means forgiving and liberating ourselves. I walked out of the prison feeling much more positive about it all and saw Daniel waiting for me. Say, we make a good team. What do you think about being my partner? Partner? For investigative purposes or for life? Hmm, how about both? Bonjour! I'm Chloe, and I live here in the French city of Toulouse. I'm working on my debut romance novel about a couple destined to be together despite all the hurdles they face. If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment- BOO! <laughs> Lost in your dumb fictional world again? If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment! <laughs> That's Cedric, my brother. But I doubt it, because we have nothing in common. And he's a massive pain in my- uh -huh. Anyway... I guess you could say I'm introverted, and I dream of becoming a best-selling romance novelist, making a living out of doing what I love. Only, dreams don't always go to plan, and publishing houses don't seem to like my drafts. Meanwhile, Cedric is Satan in disguise, whose sole purpose is making my life miserable. He turned off my alarm and made me late for a meeting, changed all of my contacts' names to emojis, and one time, I woke up to see my laptop covered all in plastic wrap. The problem was, he got away with being a jerk simply because he was deemed good-looking. In his fangirl's eyes, he could do no wrong. Living with Cedric was such an endurance test, so I avoided him the best I could by going to a private school, instead of the same public school as him. Everything was fine, until our parents lost everything in stocks, and we had no choice but to move into this teeny, tiny house. One night, I went downstairs to get some water and saw Mom and Dad up late with bills piled up around them. Seeing them like that made me desperately want to help. So the next day, I told him that the public school had a creative writing club and that I wanted to transfer there. My tuition fees weren't a burden anymore, but going to the same school as Cedric was not ideal. So I insisted that he acted like he didn't know me at all. Still, the first few days were terrible as I kept getting lost and felt so out of place. I hardly looked up and only identified other students by their shoes. Thank goodness for the pink and white sneaker girl, Emma. She was the only person who actually noticed me, and when I told her about my writing dreams, she was really supportive. We became best friends and could chat about everything, even my annoying brother. Things were better at school, but not at home. My parents were still struggling to hide their money problems, and Cedric... Well, was just being Cedric. Couldn't he see that now wasn't the time for his clown antics? I helped out as much as I could by cleaning, doing laundry, preparing meals, and even got a part-time job in a patisserie. While he literally did nothing. Why can't you stop fooling around? Chill out, sis. Even when you have a mare, all the stress will give you gray hair. Fine, act like a moron and stay in this moronic place forever. I'll get our old house back alone. After a busy shift, I just wanted to get home and go straight to bed. Only when walking along the curb, I spotted Cedric doing some dumb, noisy performance. Ugh, such a laughable, selfish bum. I had to seriously hold back or else my fist would definitely land on his face. Oh, I still had the last chapter to finish. My body was ready to shut down, but I couldn't slack. Not if I wanted to complete it by Louis Beaumont's book launch. He's my favorite author. I'd planned for months to fly to Nice and hand him my manuscript. Suddenly, the lights went out. Guys, looks like the electricity company cut us off because of those unpaid bills. Gosh, we can't live like this. So I pulled out some money from the back of the manuscript. This was money for my Nice trip. But this is more urgent. So I gotta do what I have to do. Mom, Dad, here's some money. Just to help out a bit. The next day, Cedric barged into my room with a smug grin on his face. Guess who's going to Paris? Try not to miss me too much, will ya? What? B but where did you get your money from? Mom and Dad? Duh. Check it out. That's my money? 
I can't believe this. We don't even have electricity, but they gave him money to go mess around in Paris? I shoved him out of my room and slammed the door shut. I'd always tried my best to not disappoint them, yet they favored my deadbeat brother and spoiled him rotten. All this family stuff was eating me up, so on school day, I confided in Emma. Only when I tried talking to her, she seemed distracted and kept drifting with the music. Em, Em, are you listening? Oh, sorry, but this beat is straight up fire. Look, he's the winner of this contest. Isn't he amazing and talented? I looked at her phone and saw, what? Cedric? So he came to Paris for this stupid contest? Don't talk about him, okay? That's my selfish, uncaring brother I've always talked about. Be his fan, and we can't be friends anymore. Things got even worse when Cedric went home and literally made it rain with his reward money. Chloe, look at all of this money your brother won. Thanks to his talent, we can go back to our old house. Ugh, why is everything so easy for Cedric? He did some nonsense rap and became a celebrity? Meanwhile, it's me who had to give up my trip, my dream. At least we got the old house back, but day after day, these annoying reporters are driving me crazy. How did you come up with meaningful lyrics? Meaningful? Everyone knows rap isn't actually music. It's just some noise full of swearing and insults. Yeah, ignore her. She's just cranky from skipping breakfast. There's no escaping Cedric's name, not even at school. Please, please, please introduce me to him. Why are you so obsessed with him? Don't you remember anything I said about how terrible he is? Come on, give his music a try. I can't believe someone who wrote such beautiful lyrics can be as bad as you say he is. Fine. If she wanted to meet him, then I'd grant her that wish. It's about time she saw his true face. I opened the door and showed Emma inside when suddenly we were covered in a cloud of confetti. Why the long face? My grand welcome was the bomb. Do you know how long it would take to clean this mess? Ugh, Em, this is my brother. An idiot. Idiot brother. Em. But then I turned around to see Emma already soaking up Cedric's every word. I can't take this anymore. My time would be better spent writing. Trembling thoughts. Through fear, your eyes will find mine. Love will bind us like a cat's nine lives. Wow, that's perfect. Wait, that voice sounds unfamiliar. Oh my, this guy was heartthrob level handsome. Bonjour, I'm Pierre, Cedric's colleague. Is he home? Yes, let me show you the way. What are you seeking him for? We're collaborating on my next album, so I'm here to practice. As a senior singer, I also helped Cedric build his show and industry connections. He's superb, isn't he? After that day, Pierre visited my house more often. Turns out he's a sweet and gentle guy who always brought us gifts, such as flowers and scented candles. And after dinner, he even helped me wash up. How can such an angel work with my devil brother? One day when I was out with Emma, suddenly she looped her arm around me and said, You sure seem chirper these days. It's probably because Cedric's often away on music shows. You're telling me it has nothing to do with Pierre? Come on, Chloe, it's written all over your face. Fine. He's really sweet, and his smile is as bright as the sun. How can I approach someone like him? Hmm, why not start with a love letter? I took Emma's advice and wrote the most romantic letter ever, then brought it to his company. If anyone asks, I'll say I'm here to see my brother. Huh? Are they arguing? I went over to Pierre and asked him what had happened. Oh, it's nothing really. Cedric is just stressed out from his busy schedule. Yeah, right. As if there was anything stressful about this nonsense rap thing. Now is my moment. So I stuffed the letter in Pierre's hand, then ran away. I was still giddy with excitement when I arrived home. Only Cedric ruined my mood by sitting there looking like he'd swallowed a wasp. Oh no, are all showbiz parties too tiring? What a tragedy. Shut it, Chloe. What does a dreamer like you know? Dreamer? At least I'm not a self-centered, shallow idiot. I sacrificed everything so you could go after your dumb rap career. And all you do is act like an ungrateful jerk. Grow up and stop being so childish. I expected him to shout back at me, but instead he gave me this dead look, then trudged off to his room. He didn't come down for dinner or anything for the next three days. Hmm, this house sure was quiet without him. But he's a chill guy and things will go back to normal soon, right? I guess I should just enjoy the peace while I could. The next day, Emma showed up at my house all worked up. Is Cedric here? He didn't answer any texts and calls. Huh? You two are messaging each other? Uh, um, I just wonder if he's okay. How typical of you to talk to him behind my back. 
To my surprise, Emma just impatiently barred past me and ran up to Cedric's room. Then she reappeared with a note. Cedric's gone! Jeez, how irresponsible and impulsive. He really doesn't care about anyone but himself. Enough! I won't listen to you badmouth your brother anymore! Can't you see he's seriously struggling and showing signs of depression? Who's the one who doesn't care about family here? And you really believe you're better than him? Emma's outburst left me stunned. Is Cedric really depressed? How was I meant to know that when he's always goofing around? That evening, Mom and Dad kept fretting about Cedric's disappearance. He gave his all to help us while we could do nothing to help him. Remember those days he performed on the streets? He gave us all the money he earned, and he always tried to cheer us up when things were down. Cedric only wanted to join the rap contest to win some more money. He was very nervous, but we believed in him, so we gave him the money to enter. Oh God, so I misunderstood him all along? Suddenly, I remembered his winning track that Emma insisted that I listen to. I went up to my room and turned it on. It's about us, his beloved family. Turns out he wasn't a deadbeat, idle loser like I thought he was. He always puts on a happy face to lift other spirits while quietly struggling with his own demons. I needed to find him and apologize immediately, so I went to Pierre for help. I had no idea he was struggling so badly. I should have noticed that he was suffering and not overloaded him with work. But there's an important show coming. If Cedric was a no-show, he'd be in breach of his contract and have to pay a huge sum in compensation. Oh no, that's not good. What should we do now? You know what? You look a lot like Cedric. How about you disguise as him? But how? Don't worry, our makeup team is top-notch. Nobody's gonna know. This all sounded crazy, but it seemed like I had no other choice. My family couldn't be in debt again for this. Being this close to Pierre made my heart flutter. He took me for my makeover, then I learned to lip-sync and perform on stage. I even tried to walk and talk like my brother. I felt bad about deceiving his fans, but I couldn't risk Cedric getting into big trouble. It's only a one-time thing. Sometimes I lip-sync too. It's no big deal. I felt a bit confused. Then suddenly, a stage crew member above me accidentally dropped a wrench. It could have knocked me off if Pierre didn't swoop in and save the day. Now, back to practicing, and oh boy, was it hectic. Pierre stayed with me the whole time and was really supportive. We also never stopped trying to look for Cedric together. I felt our connection growing, but couldn't figure out why he hadn't made any move. Maybe my first letter hadn't been clear enough, so I sneaked into Pierre's room and left him another one. Only later that day, I saw him glued to his phone, so I took a glance. Huh? He was messaging somebody with a very cheesy nickname. Right, he wasn't interested because he was already dating someone else. Oh no, I have to reclaim my second letter before humiliating myself. I ran into his room but couldn't find it anywhere. Wait, what's this? Here comes the big night. I was absolutely terrified. Pierre smiled sweetly at me and held my hands. We shared a look, then stepped on stage together. There were so many people out there. My legs felt numb, but then I spotted Emma beaming at me from the front row, and my nerves eased again. I quickly found the beat, then lip-synced and danced perfectly. But halfway through the song, the stage light suddenly went off and a shadowy figure walked toward me. Cedric! The audience oohed and awed, then clapped in excitement as Cedric continued the rest of the performance. During the break, everyone went backstage and saw Pierre grab Cedric's arm. Cedric, where have you been? We've all been worried sick. Drop the act. You're just using me to make yourself rich, forcing me to do show after show, and when I was exhausted, you pushed lip syncing onto me. What are you talking about? These shows are to help you gain support. Starting out in this industry is hard. Hey, I even lent you some money to get your house back. You mean the money you used to tie my brother in with a stupid contract? You compelled Cedric to work exclusively with you, performing two years for free to clear his debt. But according to these receipts for each show, the money he should have received already exceeded the amount he owed you. W what the? Surprised much? Now we have all the evidence against you. So what? Cedric signed it anyway. A contract is a contract. Break it and I'll get you kicked out of the company and make sure you never get any show again. Your whole family will be dirt poor alike before. I don't think so. What would the public say if they knew you've been flirting with him all along? And when he rejected you, you manipulated and overworked him until he agreed to date you. Uh, uh, how long have you known? Long enough to expose you. Now, you have two options. One, cancel the contract within the next 24 hours and pay my brother the excess money you exploited from him. Or two, we'll publish what you did and see if you survive in showbiz afterward. I don't hate you for having feelings for me, but this deal is not fair. 
Pierre looked nervous and angry, then just stormed off. I turned to my annoying, goofy brother and gave him a big hug. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you before. Why didn't you tell us that you borrowed money to get back our house? I know how much you wanted our house back, so I joined the contest, but the prize money wasn't enough. That's when I asked Pierre. Silly me. If you hadn't found the contract and receipts, I would have still believed his lies and worked till exhaustion. So you did get my message. I was about to shut off all connections to the world. But that day I felt super uneasy, so I opened my phone and saw your message. Must be sibling telepathy. One more thing. Emma, you truly helped me find myself again. What do you say? Do you want to be a superstar rapper's girlfriend? Yes, I do. Please keep the lovey-dovey stuff to a minimum in front of me. Luckily, I was spared when a stage crew called Cedric to go back on stage. You know, it's not easy for us artists to have a big platform, literally like the stage. We always have a price to pay for the glory. Because of that, I'm eternally grateful for my amazing family and friends who always have my back. And a big shout out to my sister for being my inspiration for this song. Then he started rapping to my poetry. His rhymes and my poems are flowing, really getting the crowd going. He's a lyrical gymnastic genius. After the show, Cedric received a video from Pierre. Cedric, I'm sorry for taking advantage of you. I like you so much and wanted to keep you close. I'll pay back what I owe you, then take a break from showbiz for a while. I really hope one day you can forgive me. Phew, all that drama was a lot for my introverted self to handle. So now I've treated myself to some me time to recharge. Thanks to Cedric rapping, dozens of my publishers reached out to me for my poems, including those who'd previously rejected me. <sighs> Gosh, am I seeing it wrong? A male from Louis Beaumont himself? I can't wait to see him in person. And you keep working on your dream. Perhaps a secret angel is on the way to bring you a wonderful opportunity. Hi there, I'm Anita, a science pro and robotics prodigy. I've won countless trophies, including one for making a talking replica of BB-8. But it's my crush's heart that I can't win. Tom has just refused to accompany me to the last middle school dance. But who cares? I've got my bestie Barb. It'll still be fun. We can go together. We arrived at the dance to find that everyone had dates, except for us. Well, this is a little awkward. Move. This is a dance floor, grannies. Either you dance or get out. Bet this is the first party you've ever got to attend. As if Tom would go out with such a loser. Yeah, you should try asking your robots out instead. As they walked off laughing, I felt so disheartened. Barb told me not to listen to them, but their words niggled away at me. I realized if I didn't change, then I'd waste the rest of my teen years by being a loser that got left out of all the fun. I needed to reinvent myself now before it was too late. Over the summer break, I thought it over and realized that there was only one way forward. I should flip the script, where nobody knew who I was. And this is the perfect occasion for that. High school! I purposely chose a school that's across the city. It's a bit inconvenient, but that's how to be sure I'd not run into anyone from my local middle school. Of course, except for Barb. She's going there with me also. Hey, recognize me? I'm still Anita. Like my new look? I've had a style update, ditched my glasses and all the uncool geeky stuff. Ooh, let's surprise my bestie. <laughs> Anita? Whoa, talk about a Captain Marvel transformation. Gee, thanks. This hair color is so in season right now. Hang on, you look just like Chelsea. Oh, do I? How funny. You sound like her too. Okay, so Chelsea was this popular girl from middle school. Um, yeah, I may have spent all summer studying her. All right, I actually mirrored her style and mannerisms. I'm just learning to better myself. This isn't any different from using humans as models when programming a robot. Besides, it's not like Chelsea's here to mind. Speaking of robots, how's your BB-8? No, that's my past. We'll never be cool and get boyfriends if our peers think we're nerds. Come with me after school, I'll give you a makeover too. It's okay, Anita. I don't mind being a nerd. But if this makes you happy, then you have my full support. My sweet, naive Barb has no idea how incredible being cool would be. They're the cool kids here, aka celebrities. They're so dazzling and popular. And oh my god, who's that? He's so dreamy. So, I confidently strutted over to introduce myself to the whole group one. Ah! Luckily, no one seemed to notice my fall, or they just didn't care. <sighs> Anyways, this was only my first day here. I had loads of time to fit in with the celebrities, and then catch that hottie, who supposedly named Eric's attention. 
At first, the popular girls didn't notice me. But then a few days in, Lou, the celebrity's leader, had a lipstick emergency and I sprung to her rescue. See? I told you, this burgundy shade really pops against your cool undertone. Ruby Woo? That's so 2015, Ashley. You can put that away. And easy peasy, I became part of the group. They invited me to their parties, shopping trips, and spa days. It's like entering a completely new world. An extra shiny one. I got to sit with them at lunch where they Ubered low-calorie food. Normally, I had the same as them, but today my mom packed me a special sandwich with the moist maker, just like Ross's from Friends. Sorry, guys, but Anita doesn't share food. <laughs> Are you seriously going to drink that? You can practically see the fat and lactose swirling in it. Gross. Oh, okay. Looks like the moist maker would have to wait. I looked around and saw Barb sharing her mom's amaze balls, mac and cheese with her new geeky friends. I've not spoken to Barb properly in weeks. We kept trying to reschedule as I had manicures with Lou, Haley's party, and all these ever after school shopping trips. Which kept getting so expensive. Aren't you gonna buy that? You haven't bought anything. Um, that's because I only wear tailor-made clothes made of Egyptian cotton or at least silk linen. Um, okay. In that case, you can be our assistant. Make sure you wear a cute cardigan tomorrow for a OOTD Instagram post. Ashley has made a list of the available colors. That's why I had to use all of my allowance on this cardigan. But it's fine. That's just how popular clicks had to be. And it's so nice of them to let me hang around. I proudly strutted alongside the celebs, looking just like one of them. Other students gobbed at us, and it sure felt good. But suddenly, this dizzy spell came over me. I started shaking and feeling cold. Then, pitch black. I woke up in the infirmary to Barb's worried face. Oh good, you're awake. It's no surprise you passed out. You aren't eating enough. What? I'm eating just fine. Besides, skinny is chic. I'm not arguing with you. You're lucky your head didn't hit the floor thanks to Eric. Eric saved me? He must have caught me like in a romantic movie. This diet is amazing. I wouldn't have been in Eric's arms without it. Later, I tried to thank him, but he put his headphones on and walked off. And I never saw him at any of the celebs' parties or anything. A hot guy like him is probably hanging out with an even cooler clique and interested in even more popular girls. I need to try harder. But my geeky side wasn't going to stay suppressed. One time, this guy slated Spider-Man 2099, my favorite character ever. Dude doesn't understand how the multiverse works, and his suit sucks. Are you kidding me? As if you know how it works, his suit incorporates Parker tech and has stealth features and exploding spider saucers. Okay, cool it, new girl. It's just some weirdo jumps around in spandex. Right, be cool. Cool kids didn't geek out over superheroes. Luckily, everyone else seemed distracted. I turned to look and saw them already flocked around some new kid with a huge backpack, a comic t-shirt, and jeans. Huh, it's like looking at middle school me. When I managed to get a closer look, I almost fell over in shock. It was Chelsea! Why would pretty popular Chelsea do a total 180 on her looks? I tried to avoid Chelsea, but then one time when I was trying to approach Eric, she appeared and he actually spoke to her. Does Chelsea know Eric? Since when? How come? Ah! Time stopped as I stared into his big dreamy eyes, but falling for each other again? <laughs> you might as well just stay in his arms. I quickly walked away and passed Chelsea. Our eyes met. Did she recognize me? She didn't say anything, but was that a smirk I saw? I needed to find out if Chelsea really recognized me, so I turned to Barb. It was a bit awkward, as we hadn't spoken in a while. But luckily, Barb was cool about it and said she'd try to find out. We chatted a bit, and then she asked me, We are still going to Comic-Con on the 7th, right? Yeah, of course. Can't wait. I was excited about Comic-Con until... A few days later, the celebrities had a big announcement. They were attending Conan Gray's concert on the 7th. Are you coming, or do you have some tragic nerdy convention to go to? Huh? That's oddly specific. I panicked and said yes to the concert. We had to give money to Ashley the next day, and she would take care of purchasing everyone's tickets. But thanks to that overpriced cardigan, how am I supposed to afford this? Hmm, I guess there was one way to pay for it. Me and Barb's Comic-Con fund, which we'd been saving since middle school. I was only borrowing and would definitely pay it back. The following day, the celebs gathered to discuss the concert. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flustered looking Barb. What about her plan? Did you just spend all your savings on some concert you don't even care about? I'm sorry, I promise I'll pay you back. I just needed some time. So, you spent my share too? How could you? I felt terrible. I never meant to upset my friend like that. I just really wanted to fit in. 
Only, after that day, I found myself miserable with the celebs. The more time I spent with them, the more things about them got me second-guessing this group's dynamic. For instance, they talked a lot about the importance of being eco-friendly, but ordered Uber Eats almost every day, and constantly brought new, cute, reusable straws in Stanley Cups. Moreover, it was always lose weight or the highway, and they even trash-talked their own group members behind their backs. I found myself often looking around for Barb and then feeling extra guilty. On my way home, I was dragging my feet, feeling awful, when I passed an appliance store. I saw some students from my school's robotics team struggling with their droid, so I gladly offered a hand. If you want my lunch money, take it, but please leave Gears Brosnan alone! We worked hard on it! I tried explaining that I just wanted to help, but they kept pushing me away. I stared down at myself and realized that I wasn't welcomed because I'd given up everything to look like a celebrity. However, I didn't feel like one. I'd stood by and let the celebs push everyone else around. Was this really the life I wanted? That weekend was supposed to be spa day with the celebs, so I went out to the mall to ask Lou for my concert ticket. I was going to sell it and pay Barb back. Only when I got there, I saw Chelsea with them, but she looked like her cool self again. Uh-oh, I better go. But too late, Chelsea caught me and told everyone. Guys, look who's here. Fun fact, Anita and I used to be friends back in middle school. Cover yourself in foundation all you want, but your nerdiness will still show. Everyone started laughing, and that's when it dawned on me. They were all in on Chelsea's plans to expose me. I wanted to leave, but I still needed my ticket back. Sure, you can have it back, but on one condition. Wash off your Chelsea disguise and go back to being pathetic little you again. And so they told me to wash my hair in this decorative basin in a lush store before everyone's confused eyes and their live streaming cameras. I swallowed my pride and did it for Barb. But afterward, Lou turned back on her word. Actually, I gave it to Chelsea. Tough luck. Oops, too bad I never agreed to the deal Lou made with you. I felt overcome with panic and shame. I ran and I bumped into someone. Eric! Seeing how upset I was, he took me for coffee and a chat. As soon as we sat down, I burst into tears and told him how I'd lost everything. My popularity, dignity, friends. It all started to fall apart when Chelsea turned up all of a sudden. And then the domino effect took over. Chelsea? I'd always known she's catty, but I never thought she'd go that far. How can you be friends with her? <laughs> what? No, it's not what you think. You still don't recognize me? What do you mean, recognize? Then he revealed that he was from my middle school. I was shooketh! But if I squinted real hard, I guess he did look vaguely familiar. Whoa, puberty hit you like a truck. Same for you. Yeah, no, it wasn't puberty for me. I got emotionally scarred from being an outcast and became afraid of missing out on cool stuff, so I turned myself into a Chelsea clone to be popular. That's insane. But if it means anything, I prefer the old you. It's great seeing you at the school. But when I saw that you changed and joined the celebs, I was kind of apprehensive. But for real, though, I would have died for you to notice me. I was beyond surprised. He liked me all along? Suddenly, Chelsea jumped in. Why has it always been her? I changed myself to look like her. Didn't you say you liked nerdy girls? So why not me? Say what? Chelsea liked Eric? So she really copied my look. And for that reason? I'm sorry, Chelsea, but it's my feelings. I can't believe you rejected me twice for this little nerd! And she doesn't even look like herself anymore! Chelsea, it's never been about looks. It's about who she is. In the midst of it, I finally understood something. I was fine just being me. I never needed to be anything else. I've switched schools and turned myself into a dork for you! Ah! You're lucky this time! I watched Chelsea stomp out. I realized how I was constantly anxious and on edge that I'd messed up while hanging out with the celebrities. I missed the truly happy moments with real friends where I could just be me. All this time, I thought I'd been missing out on all the fun, but turns out, I missed nothing. The true way to have beautiful teenage years is to spend it with people that really appreciate you and do the things that you actually enjoy. I thanked Eric, then left. There was something important I needed to do first. I went home and fixed my BB-8, then took it over to Barb's house. Sorry, Barb. I'm so sorry, Barb. I was so desperate to be cool that I overlooked what really mattered. I miss you and our friendship so much. I missed you too. And I saw that humiliating video and just wanted to know you were okay. On second thoughts, I'll forgive you if you give me your BB-8. <laughs> no can do, as I'm selling it online to make money to pay you back. I only brought it here to make my apology more meaningful. Did it work? We both hug. The next few days at school, I tried my best to fix things. I returned to my old image, well, with a slight upgrade. 
I can't let my beauty skills go to waste now. And I dug out all my geeky stuff. I showed up at the robotics club, and this time I confidently strode over and immediately fixed their robot. I told you I could help. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a celebrity's job. Look at you, all happy and smiley with your own loser nerd kind. Yeah, I'm happy, while you once tried and failed to be one of us, remember? Being a nerd isn't just about appearance, it's about what's inside. By the way, how was the concert? I heard your fanatic behavior got you kicked out. Sounds exciting. Chelsea and the celebs looked fuming as they sashayed off, but I didn't care, as I was finally back where I belonged. Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table, so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%. Cereal is $2.49. Potatoes, laundry detergent. So the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades. And by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. And the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. 
I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously, he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around, who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Yeah? And an opportunity is coming your way. There's an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. 
I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I- I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. (sighs) Only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey, Laura, what are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot in our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sinked my toes and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes. So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. So, here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. 
Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad, I will make you proud. I was tidying up my room when a call came through. Oh, my big sister! She lives with mom, so I've not seen her in a year. Blair, it's been a hot minute. How have you been? Hi, Karenin. Well, not so good. Mom laughed. Oh no, what happened? Then Blair told me it's due to mom's debts. She had run away from the loan sharks and left my sister behind. That's awful! So I told her to come to Portland and live with us. She agreed to come, but then I realized that Blair staying here wasn't really down to me. Oh well, it's not like I could leave her in danger, right? So, later over dinner, I told my family about Blair's current situation. Oh, how terrible! Yes, Blair must come and stay. Yay! Their kindness didn't surprise me as my stepmom and stepsis, Chrissy, have been lovely to me ever since I moved in. You know what's even cooler? Christy is a rising teen pop star, but she's so sweet. We've grown super close, and she even told me all about her secret boyfriend, Damien. They'd been together long before Chrissy became famous, and had since kept their relationship out of the public eye. This is so exciting! I haven't seen Blair since our parents split. This guest bedroom is gonna be hers, and we're living under one roof again. Blair's basically my alter ego. She's pretty, outgoing, and popular, while I'm more of a homebody. Come to think of it, I see a lot of Blair and Chrissy. They're both so extroverted and confident. They'll get along just great. But to everyone's surprise, Blair showed up looking completely different. Wow, it seems like living with mom, a party animal, had clearly influenced Blair. Hello, Blair. I'm Stacy, and this is my daughter Chrissy. Welcome to Portland. You must be tired from your trip. Let me take your bag. Sure. Huh? Doesn't it seem like everyone's excited about Blair's arrival, all except for Blair? Maybe she's just tired. I showed Blair her room and helped her unpack. Oh my god, they're unbearable. How can you stand living with them? They think they're so much better than everyone else. What? Blair had only spoken to them for five seconds. Why she disliked them so much already? Give them a chance, they're really lovely. Blair's probably just stressed out from all the mom stuff. Hopefully with time, she'll see how great stepmom and Chrissy are. Only things didn't get any better. After class, both Chrissy and Blair came up to me. Hey, hey wanna, wanna hang, hang out? out? I asked her first. Oh, then we can all go together. Sorry, Chrissy. It's just that we haven't seen each other in ages, and there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe we can go to Sephora tomorrow to check out that new Anastasia palette you like. Sure, have fun! Then Chrissy left. I'm sure she really wants us all to hang out. Oh, please. She thinks just because she's popular, she can always get her own way. She's mid. Okay, maybe it's best not to mention either of my sisters to one another to avoid World War III. Things went on like that for a while. I took turns to hang out with Blair and Chrissy. Once when Blair was chilling in my room, I noticed her smiling at her phone. Seemed like our homegirl had finally found something fun to enjoy around here. I excitedly asked her what she was watching. Look, isn't he cute? He goes to our school also. Wait, no it can't be. That's Damien, Chrissy's secret boyfriend. If Blair learns that the girl she hates is her crush's girlfriend, all hell will break loose. I think I'll ask him out. Really? He's so popular he must have hundreds of girls wrapped around his finger already. Besides, what if he's not into you? You'll only be rejected and get hurt. What do you mean? Am I not pretty enough? Oh, I see. You think that a popular guy like him is only suitable for your famous, fabulous other sister, Chrissy, don't you? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're gorgeous. In fact, out of his league. You deserve a guy who has time just for you. So why bother competing for attention from someone like him? Okay, thanks, but he's my type. I'll ask for his number Monday morning. Oh no, I just accidentally encouraged Blair to ask out Chrissy's boyfriend. I can't reveal that Chrissy and Damien are secretly together, but I can't let Blair steal someone else's boyfriend either. What a mess. I tossed and turned all night. Then when I woke up, I decided I'd just have to make Blair stop liking Damien. I don't condone catfishing, but right now it's the only way. Hey there, Blair, right? It's Damien here from math class. What you doing? A few seconds later, Blair replied, Oh my god, I was just thinking about getting your number. Looks like the first steps of my plan are working. I texted Blair as Damien regularly. I made sure he was a man of a thousand red flags. But for some puzzling reason, Blair seemed smitten with him. 
I gave him a seriously challengeable temperament. He could throw a tantrum one moment and become sweet the next. Then I photoshopped Damien's selfie into a photo of a messy bedroom, then sent it to Blair. Surely she couldn't abide by a narcissistic, messy guy like him. I'm so sorry, Damien, but I have to save my family. Huh? What? She sent back a picture of her room being messier than ever. She's always the clean freak around here. I had to see with my own eyes. Hey, may I borrow your hair curler? And what's with your room? So what if it's a bit untidy? Neat people are total psychos. Okay, it's time to get personal. Blair's biggest pet peeve was being commented on her look. So when she sent Damien a selfie, I didn't hold back. Babe, can't you dress more ladylike? And you really should cover up that awful tattoo. Voila, that's how you wake up the beast inside this fierce girl. <laughs> However, the next day, Blair showed up with a completely new look. Worse still, she walked straight over to Damien. I had to fake having an emergency to prevent a disaster from happening. Afterward, I texted Blair. I'm not ready to let everyone know about us yet. Please understand, babe. You know I like you. There, that should stop her from trying to approach him again. Even so, during lunch, Blair wouldn't stop blabbering about Damien and showing me his text. Isn't he quite rude? You don't normally let guys tell you what to do. He's not. He's just opinionated. I'm into that. No, he's horrible. I don't understand why you like him. He's sweet. You just don't know him like I do. Our love is complicated, but that's what makes it special. Seriously, you called that love? What do you know? Okay, little Miss Love Guru, if you're really that experienced, make that guy your boyfriend. Succeed, and I'll give out the love of my life. If not, I'll do as I please. What Blair is daring me to do was impossible. That guy, Adrian, is as popular as Damien. While Damien's the friendly one, Adrian is nicknamed Jack Frost due to his icy cold exterior. Rumor has it, no one has ever seen him crack a smile. Surrender, as expected. Then step aside, sister. Not knowing what else to do, I agreed to the bet. This is for Blair, for Chrissy, for Dad's happiness. Hi, Adrian, right? I, I, I'm... Uh, are you free tonight? Or whenever? He gave me this cold glance, then went back to chatting with Damien. Please, I'm just trying to win a bet with my sister. One smile from you is enough to save the fate of an entire family and stop two girls becoming homeless. Can you just- Adrian gave me this odd look. Then he burst out laughing and took my hand. Sure thing. Can't wait for our date tonight. I left in a haze of confusion. That really just happened? Adrian must be messing around. But nope, he actually showed up at my doorstep that evening. This meant I'd won the bet, right? So I called Blair over to show her, but she just brushed it off. That proves nothing. Talk to me when Ice Boy professes his love for you. Man, I guess this means I'm going on a date. The tension in here was palpable, so I decided to break the awkward silence. Hey, where are we going? I mean, this isn't actually a real date, is it? It's definitely real. You insisted. I must have looked so dazed that he continued. Don't worry, I'm not messing with you. Anyway, I think you'll like where I'm taking you. I used to think he was incapable of smiling, but turns out he looks even cuter when he does. A drive for cinema? Wow, I'd seen these in old movies, but I had no idea it still existed. So, what's the deal with your sister Chrissy? You mentioned the bet? You know that Chrissy is my sister? Of course, it's not exactly hidden. Besides, I'm friends with Chrissy's boyfriend. So, you know? Yep, there's no secrets between me and Damien. And don't worry, I have his back. So, can you answer my question now? <laughs> I like this different side to Adrian. So before I could stop myself, I told him how the bet wasn't with Chrissy, but with my other sister, Blair. And I was catfishing Blair as Damien to protect my family, but it's barely working. Whoa, that's intense. Secrets make things complicated. Life sure would be easier if we could just be ourselves. So, why did you decide to go on a date with me? Don't you think it's weird? <laughs> no, not really. Beats how girls normally ask me out. I arrived home feeling on cloud nine, but then I walked past Chrissy's room and saw her upset. I asked her what's going on. It's Damien. He wants us to go public, but I told him I'm not ready yet. I like having this part of me private, and I don't want Damien to be open to backlash and scrutiny. But he didn't understand and thought I was embarrassed of him. Oh, Chrissy, what a pain. Give him time, I'm sure he'll come around. But the school performance is in a few days. How am I supposed to take the stage in this state? I hated seeing Chrissy so downhearted like this. And I thought about Adrian and what he said during our date about honesty. I don't know much about the pressures of fame, but I do know that your feelings for Damien are real. I don't think love is something that you should hide. 
Honesty is the best policy. It might be hard at first, but you can get through it together. Now, come to my case, I should also follow my own advice and put an end to my catfishing before it gets out of hand. I tried hard to think of the best way to break this to Blair while we were walking to school the next day. After much hesitation, I pulled her aside before entering school for a talk. Only, before I could get to the main part, Damien walked past and oddly, Blair didn't do so much as to blink. Seeing my confusion, she said, Yesterday, he ignored all of my messages. You're right, I deserve someone better. Anyway, what did you want to tell me? Oh, that, um, my date with Adrian was amazing. It all happened because of you, so thanks. And sorry about Damien. It's okay. That's strange. Did my smitten sister really just give up that easily? But anyway, at least it's all over now. <sighs> and I don't even have to come clean anymore. The day of Chrissy's performance arrived. Me, Adrian, and Damien had backstage access. Actually, I'm here for emotional support as Chrissy is about to tell everyone about her relationship with Damien. This is a surprise for Damien too. He just thinks we're here to get a better view of Chrissy. <laughs> she slays the performance and the audience adored her. Thanks everyone, thank you so much. Actually, today is an extra special day because I have something. But suddenly Blair stormed onto the stage and snatched Chrissy's mic. How about making it even more special with this breaking news? Everyone, she's had a secret boyfriend all this time. She made the poor guy hide in the shadow so she can keep her squeaky clean image. She's lied to you all for years. Is someone like that worthy of your support? Blair ran off as soon as she finished. Boos start coming from the crowd. Many people began commenting on the situation in true TMZ fashion. What is this, 2009 VMA? No way, my Chrissy is taken? Meanwhile, Chrissy had a panic attack and froze there on the stage. I didn't know what to do. Neither did Damien. Luckily, Adrian kept calm and grabbed the walkie-talkie, connected to Chrissy's in-ear. Chrissy, listen to me. In times like these, there's only one way out, and that's confronting the truth and taking back the narrative. I looked at Adrian and realized something about my own problem. More on that later. For now, let's see how Chrissy handles this. Well, there goes my big reveal. Yes, I'm in a relationship but I only kept it quiet because I wanted to separate my personal life from my professional one. Being a public figure and a teenager at the same time is not as easy as you might think, so I didn't want to drag my loved one into that life too soon. On reflection, maybe this wasn't the best way to deal with this. I won't hide anything from my fans anymore, and those who truly support me won't judge or speak badly of my decision. Everyone, I want you to meet Damien, my boyfriend. The audience went wild. Aw, this is so cute but I still had one more problem to deal with. Blair! I look everywhere and finally found her hiding under the bleaches. Blair, it's just me. Please come out. I started to talk about what just happened, but Blair didn't want to hear it. I know everything. You tricked me because you think I'm an idiot. La 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 la. I let her finish her outburst and calm down. Then I apologized and told her the truth. I only did it because I didn't want you going after a boy who's already taken. I know I went about it in a completely wrong way but I just wanted to keep our family together. I love you, and I don't want to be in the middle of your jealousy towards Chrissy anymore. If you just gave her a chance, you could have just been honest with me. This is all because you prefer Chrissy over me, don't you? No, of course not. I just wanted to protect you, and for there to not be any more conflict between you and Chrissy. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Actually, I'm not jealous of Chrissy because she's famous and gorgeous. It's actually because you guys are really close. We used to be that close when our parents divorced, and now it's like I've been replaced. Blair's honesty touched me in the feels. I gave her a big hug, but then realized that we weren't alone. Actually, I'm jealous of you, Blair. You're all Kieran and Eva talks about, and I feel that even though we're close, I can't compete with her real sister. Oh, so the tension between them wasn't just over a boy. It was actually over me. To me, you're both my real sisters, and I love you dearly. Come on, sisterly cuddle. Oh, by the way, how did you know that I was pretending to be Damien? I overheard your conversation with Chrissy. It didn't take much digging around to figure out it was you texting me, not the real Damien. While we're at it, I find it worrying you were still into him after all those red flags. In future, please let me vet your dates first. You're too easily blinded by good looks. Oh dear, that's why us girls have to stick together, especially when it comes to boys. Hey, I'm Lydia. It might seem like this enchanting forest is real, but it's even better. 
It's VR, and you're looking at its creator. This is nature at its most perfect form, unpolluted, a home to many wild creatures. Those are actually my friend's avatars. One of them is Layla, my best friend, my only real life friend. All the kids used to think I was a freak for my obsession with plants and nature. Then I met Layla, who was also a nature geek in the neighborhood. I knew right away that she and I were going to be best of friends. We loved all the same weird things, like pickled garlic and growing peppers to make pepper spray. We were basically inseparable, and with Layla by my side, I couldn't care less about what the other kids said anymore. But my world suddenly turned upside down when Layla graduated high school and had to move out for college. Saying goodbye filled me with sadness and fear. Layla was my only friend, and I would feel lost without her. So she came up with the idea of using VR to keep me company. Little did I know, it completely changed my life. VR opened a whole new world for me, giving me the tools to build the land of my dreams, a place where Layla and I could hang out and explore nature the way we used to. Soon enough, I quickly got a grasp on VR and became a big name player in the game. Before long, my life was more virtual than reality. Suddenly, everything was black. I took off the VR headset and mom and dad were standing at the door. Why are you still here? It's the middle of the school day, for God's sake. You've had your head buried in that game since your junior year. Enough is enough. You know what? We've been too easy on her. You need to get into a college at the end of the school year, or we will kick you out of this house. Then how am I supposed to play VR? You know it's my life. Not my problem. You're 18. It's time for you to grow up and face reality. Mom! I'm with your dad on this. Now hurry up and get to school. Later, I reached out to Layla for help. Why don't you apply to my college? Huh, that seems like a good idea. I'd get to see you in person again. Right? You'll be out of your parents' reach, and it's an easy school to get into. They just need your high school transcript. Simple. Girl, say no more. Sign me in. Months passed, and it was finally college admission day. Man, it is packed here. Where could I find the school garden? There it is. But where's Layla? There was only a boy sitting here reading a book. He was literally glowing in the sunshine. He suddenly looked up and our eyes met. Ah, oh, that was so awkward. Lydia! Oh my god, I'm so glad you're here. Finally, we've reunited after two years. Layla, I missed you too. I, oh, you look different. The girl standing in front of me was totally dolled up from top to toes. What happened to her? Oh, you know, I found my style ever since I got here. Don't worry, I'll help you out with your style too. But I like my style. Anyway, do you know what major you're in? I haven't decided yet. Better hurry up. Our school has a rule. To stay here, you have to choose a major within your first week. But no biggie, just go to my department. Greenhouse. I'm the class president now. Come on, I'll show you around. Then, Layla led me to her department infrastructure, and I was absolutely impressed. It was equipped with modern experiment and technology and exotic plants. Right then, a group of students swept past me and flocked around Layla. She introduced them as her new friends, but they just gave me the screening from head to toe, then straight up ignored me. Ugh, rude. Whatever, I need some alone VR time anyway. I put on the headset and doing some boxing moves, but accidentally knocked over something in real life. Layla, why is your friend wearing the VR thing and breaking our stuff? Don't you dare tell me she's from VR. No, no, no. She just uses VR since she's socially anxious. I'll talk to her. Lydia, listen, if you're going to become a greenhouse major, you have to lay off the VR a little bit. You can't be carrying the headset around campus, okay? I confusedly nodded my head. Isn't she also playing VR with me all the time, though? Afterwards, I went to get settled into my dorm room to find a girl playing my fave VR motorcycle race while riding her hoverboard. She's good, but I'm the boss of this game. Instantly, I joined the race and quickly passed her. But man, this girl was fierce. We ended up reaching the finish line at the same time. Whoa, that was epic! I'm Lydia, by the way. It's my first day and I'm assigned to this room. You must be my roommate? Yep, I'm Christine, class president of the VR department. You seem to know VR really well. How long have you been playing? I'm kinda new. Just started two years ago. Sheesh. You've got games, girl. Wanna join our department? The next day, Christine showed me around the VR department, which was full of the newest techs. Dude, this is so sick! Every week, we have an exhibition of new VR technology, and we mainly work and interact in VR. No need for awkward real-life convo. Besides, our department also joined the school annual creativity competition for the huge prize of $10,000, which we could use to develop more modern VR technology. Whoa! This place was heaven! Just imagine playing VR all day, every day! Holy moly, can it be? Soccer shots enhanced? I joined in the game immediately and gave it a big kick, scoring a goal. Wait, did I break the pots again? I took off my headset to see a guy doubled over in pain. 
Oh god, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm good, I'm fine. His face seemed awfully familiar. Oh, I remember you from the school garden the other day. Yeah, that was me. I'm Marshall. Thinking about applying to VR? Yeah, I'm Lydia. Lydia, I think you'd like it here. I suddenly felt my face getting hot when I was saved by a phone call from Layla. I quickly excused myself and ran right into her. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. There's a welcome party tonight and you're definitely going. N no, no party. Oh, come on. I'll introduce you to our research group. You've heard about the creativity competition for departments, right? Greenhouse is in it to win it. But no buts. Let's get ready. At the party, Layla dragged me to where the greenhouse kids were hanging out. They were still glaring at me. I should just leave. But on my way out, I bumped into Marshall. Hey, Lydia, I was looking for you. You dropped this handkerchief back at the VR department. It's from your grandma, right? Oh, my God, thank you. But how come you know it's my grandma's? Uh, um, I just guess. I... I saw your initials on it. Hey, back off, you VR freaks! Stop talking with our new member! Poof, are you sure? This morning she seemed really fond of all our gizmos and gadgets. What are you talking about? Lydia, explain this! What's there to explain? Your pea brain can't read between the lines, huh? Layla lunged at Christine and a fist fight broke out between them. That's why I don't fit in in social gatherings. Hey, wanna get out of here? Yes, please. Marshall explained that there was beef between the VR and greenhouse departments. They were neck and neck for many things, especially the scholarship competition. But sometimes, both went too far. The greenhouse put insects in the VR facility rooms, which chewed up all their cables. To get back at them, the VR messed with the water system in the greenhouse, which caused water blackout and killed dozens of plants. And naturally, the presidents, Layla and Christine, were always at each other's throats. Shoot, I was planning on choosing VR as my major, but that would mean turning myself into her enemy. What am I supposed to do? I tried turning back to VR to take my mind off things, but I could hardly concentrate. Lydia, why is your head stuck in the clouds? I've been thinking. I want to be in the VR department. Greenhouse is good, but I'm not sure it's for me. I just don't want us to be enemies. It's okay. We're still friends no matter what you decide. Just follow what feels good in your heart. Aw, she'd put me above all her rivalries? She hadn't changed so much after all. First thing the next morning, I went to apply to the VR department, then caught sight of Layla. Hey, Layla! I made my decision. I've applied for VR department. What? You can't be serious! Choosing VR would mean you're just throwing away your dream and living in an unreal fantasy. Unreal? It's more real than the cool girl with hot friends thing you've got going. And why would you tell me to follow my heart when you clearly didn't think I should? I, I told you that? I nodded my head, confused. I might have slipped my tongue or something. Just think about it again. Something was off. I swear she really seemed genuine yesterday. Over day, I got back to my dorm room only to find out my headset cracked and wouldn't turn on. Who did this? Freaked out, I only thought of one person who could help me fix it now. Marshall. It would take a few days to fix it. Oh no, I couldn't pass a day without VR. <laughs> I think you'll find something to do. Like what? You're more than welcome to hang here. Dang, this guy's cheeky. Suddenly, Marshall's phone rang, and he excused himself for a few minutes. I looked around his room and noticed two VR headsets on the table. Maybe Marshall wouldn't bother if I borrowed a spare set, right? As it turned on, my own forest appeared in front of me. Was he following me? I clicked on his profile to see. He was logged in as Layla. My friend Layla. So, the Layla I've been talking to was not the real Layla, but Marshall? How long had this been going on? And did Marshall know me from the beginning? Lydia? I took off the headset to see Marshall standing there, stunned. What's this? Explain to me now! It all started when I got my department's pricey drone stuck on the roof of the greenhouse building. Layla was up there, so I begged her to give it back to me. She only agreed under one condition, that I had to use her VR account to play with you, without telling you that. At first, I only did it as part of the deal, but after a while, I find her the funniest, smartest, and most creative girl, and I couldn't help but spending time with you. You're telling me that this whole year I've been talking to someone I thought was my best friend, but it was actually just some random guy, and you have the nerve to keep lying to me? Marshall, give me my VR, and stop hovering around Lydia or she's gonna find out. She already did. Lydia, I can explain. Was it because of the stupid rivalry between Greenhouse and VR? What's so important about it that you had to lie to your best friend? You've changed, Layla, and I don't think you're my friend anymore. I stormed off, fighting back tears. I couldn't look at either of them any longer. When I got back to my dorm, Christine was already there. I asked her about my VR headset. I actually saw that Layla around our room earlier. She must have done it. That was a low move, Layla. 
But I was too fed up with her to even be mad. The greenhouse department could be trying to sabotage us again. Now, this is war. I'm going to gather everyone so we can plan our counterattack. Whatever, this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. On my first VR free day, I was the only person in my class without their headset. Even the professors engaged through VR. All I could do was sit and stare at people, which reminded me of those lonely days before Layla came into my life. The next few days kept on repeating themselves, until one day, my body started boiling, and my head was buzzing like it was full of bees. Professor, I'm not feeling well. I need to go back to my dorm. But he didn't flinch one bit. No one did, except this guy. Hey, need an aspirin? He extended out his hand, but there was nothing there. A virtual pill? Seriously? No, it doesn't work. Aw oh, man, bummer. I tried getting up, but my body grew heavy and weak. I kept calling Christine across the room, but no use. If only Layla was here to help me right now. No, Lydia, you can do this on your own. I leaned on the wall to prop myself up slowly, made my way back to the dorm. I was so close, but my knees trembled and I collapsed. Just then, someone came to scoop me into their arms and picked me up. I woke up in a bad headache to see Marshall cooling it down with a damp towel. Hey, you're awake. Here, have some soup and take some medicine. What are you doing here? I came to return your VR but saw you collapsing, so then I helped you into bed. I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but this was urgent, so thank you, Marshall. I threw myself into his arms and burst into tears. I thought no one was going to help me. He wrapped his arms around me, and I finally felt safe. The next day, thanks to Marshall, I felt loads better, so I went to watch the department's creativity contest. The greenhouse presented their newly bred plant species and got the highest score so far. VR, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Our newest development in headsets, uh, exploded. Christine didn't take it well. I tried to comfort her, but she just brushed me off and stormed away. Suddenly, Layla rushed towards me and pulled me into a corner. Lydia, I just want to say I'm sorry. Ever since I got here, I became the center of attention in the VR department. And I got so wrapped up in it. I had to give up playing VR with you. I don't know, Layla. Why couldn't you just tell me that? I didn't want you to be alone. You were always online, so I guess you didn't make any friends back home. That's true. This might sound ridiculous, but only now have I realized that VR isn't everything. No virtual reality can replace the real world. And real friendship goes through all kinds of ups and downs. But it lasts, just like you and I. I'm glad you realized that. And I just want to let you know, no matter what department you choose, I'll support you. Unconditionally. Thanks. But hey, why did you break my VR headset, though? Your VR? No, I didn't do it. I swear. Then how come Christine blamed it on you? I ran down to my dorm to confront Christine, but she wasn't there, and she didn't return for the rest of the night. When I got to class the next day, I put on my headset and found the rest of the department ragging on me, calling me a liar and a traitor. Somehow, pictures of me and Layla talking yesterday were plastered all over the virtual world. The audacity of you to come back here. We already know the greenhouse department is using you to spy on us. It was you who messed with our invention at the department contest. Otherwise, how could it explode? They started booing and surrounding me, so I ran for my life until a hand grabbed mine. You could run for real, you know. Ah, uh, yes, at least I'm not the only one virtually running. We made it to the building's entrance, just as the greenhouse student dragging Christine towards us, and the VR students caught up with us. Layla, what's going on? We caught this girl starting a fire in our greenhouse lab with her hoverboard, then tried to flee the scene. What? Why would you do that? It's not on purpose, okay? Then tell us the truth. Now, fine. So a day before the department's competition, I secretly made an adjustment to the VR model, but somehow it caused an error and we ended up losing the prize. I was so mad that I decided to take it out on this greenhouse bunch. Last night, I snuck into your lab, trying to take away all of your research. But suddenly, my hoverboard overheated and exploded, causing a fire to spread everywhere. I freaked out and left. You know the rest? Yeah, thanks to you, our lab was burnt to the ground. You're lucky no one got hurt. And you had the nerve to blame Lydia for losing the contest. I had to, otherwise the entire department is on to me. Oh, not just the VR department. Now everyone was furious at this crazy manipulative witch. 
What about my VR headset? Did you break it too? Well, that's just a little trick to get you and Layla to fight. You do belong to VR department after all. That means no making friends with Greenhouse. Right, guys? Guys? You've gone too far this time, Christine. And this rivalry thing is ridiculous anyway. Look where it got you. The VR students couldn't have agreed more. They immediately voted to impeach Christine from her class president role before turning her into the administration. They then apologized on Christine's behalf and offered to help the Greenhouse rebuild their lab. Of course, Layla and the Greenhouse department agreed. It looked like the start of a beautiful partnership. Within a few months, in collaboration with the VR department, the greenhouse was completely remodeled and renovated. No one even cared to mention the feud between the two departments anymore. And guess what? I applied for a second major in greenhouse. Double majoring was tough, but I had the support of Layla and Marshall and our friends in both departments. Speaking of Marshall, he wanted to take me somewhere special in the real world. He covered my eyes and led me there. Now you can look. I could have sworn I was in the VR world, but I wasn't. I could feel and smell the flowers, the soft grass, and Marshall's warm hand holding mine. Lydia, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. <clears throat> I don't want to be your virtual friend, or even a friend in real life. I wanted more, so would you like to be my girlfriend? Are you kidding me? Yes, yes, yes! <laughs> Ha ha ha.